We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mandry and I'm here with Rob H. Welcome to AV Rant. <laughs> it's uh, Tom is back. That was a I'm weird pause, but okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah, AV Red, it's your uh, home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, hey, it's episode 707, and we're recording this on 707 of the year 2020. So, uh, yeah. But main thing is that Tom is back. He's been away for two weeks. Uh, very yes. uh, large thanks to Lee Overstreet for uh, being our guest co-host while Tom was away. Who? Uh, Who? That's much Who's appreciated. That? And uh, recognize that name. Yeah, t- Tom has to regale us with the story now. Oh, it's no, it's too long. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> the too long didn't read version is uh, when they told us that we were going to have to leave for a couple of days, and I, in that, because they had the, found a little bit of mold underneath uh, our kitchen cabinets. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that went from we're going to have to replace these cabinets, no, re- re- yeah, replace just those cabinets to we're going to have to replace your entire countertops because it's gone beyond, beyond that. To we're going to have to replace all your cabinets to. We might have to replace your ceiling. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Got all the way up there. <laughs> Last I heard, it was your upper cabinets. So. <laughs> yeah, all the way to the ceiling. So yeah. So uh, we're still waiting. Uh, so, but we got kicked out of the house for you know almost two weeks, uh, completely. And then, um, so we were, while n- COVID numbers are spiking in Florida, what was I doing? Staying at Airbnbs. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what you do. That's what you do when you want to stay safe. Yeah, the only guy who goes to the beach masked, <laughs> the only family that goes to the beach masked, because we were one of the houses we stayed at was like on the beach, and it was right before the Fourth of July. And my wife was like, "We've got to get out of here. It's going to be like mm-hmm. COVID central this weekend when Fourth of July hits." So uh, it it was it was a little stressful. So as of right now, I should be good for at least this week. Clearly, okay. uh, probably next week. Almost certainly the week after that. Oh, okay. And then I'm, I'm gonna get kicked out again. Yeah. So, because they have to do, they have to take everything out. They're gonna basically strip the kitchen bare. Right. It's gonna be a complete demolish from floor to ceiling, um, uh, which is you know, it, it's a, a lot of people look like oh my god you're getting a almost brand new kitchen. Well, it will be brand new to us kitchen, for uh you know, the, the low, low price of all the insurance fees you've ever spent over the course of your lifetime, uh, which is nice. I, it could happen at any time other than right now, and it would be so much better. But uh, it's very stressful. So we're going to have to get, we're going to have to leave as they pull out all the kitchen cabinets, pull down the ceiling, replace everything, wait for countertops to come in, replace those, install everything. So they said that that, that process, depending on how well they can time it and everything else, could be a week. It could be probably two it could might maybe be three so if we end up in an airbnb where i can actually stream uh right. the last two places we were at i could not for reasons uh if there is a place i can actually stream then i will i will do it but if i can't then we'll have to get uh, somebody else in here mm. or whatever so whatever. on top of we'll all see. that uh Just won't take any questions <laughs> tom also got a new computer now using windows uh we, we thought that a new speedy, now using windows speedy speedy computer would uh would would solve things but uh looks like we're still having you know skype and obs issues between the two of us so i don't know if it's my computer didn't have problems the other times but uh I, I think skype just hates us tom i think that's what goes on there did you did you get the aspect ratio fixed well it's zoom we, we, yeah, we could try something. I don't know how to bring that into OBS yet, but uh, I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, uh, I crop you anyway, so how your aspect ratio comes in doesn't really matter, but uh, yeah, it's good times. Oh, my, co- my, stuff. my colors are odd, though. I know <laughs> Don't that. I change know anything. With that. At the I'm not changing moment, anything. Shut it's up, kind of working. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, we are back. Uh, hopefully, this stream is working. Uh, so far, kind of okay. Been a few glitches at the beginning. Uh, but yeah, we're here to answer your home theater and AV questions. Yeah, that's what we do. All right. If you want to get, sh- well, I guess we should uh, start off with the call signs. It's been a while since I've done this. Let me see if I can remember. Uh, yeah, this is AV Rant, the podcast that 
answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. That is the primary and sometimes only way to get your question onto this podcast. You can also contact us in other ways by going to avrant.com, leaving us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, uh, youtube.com slash avrant. You can come to uh, contact us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Uh, but seriously, like for real, the AV rant, the pod, the question at avrant.com is the way you want to go. It is indeed. Oh, and if you want to contact me directly, do not. Because <laughs> I have not I have not been able to migrate my mail and all the different accounts oh, from my yeah. my Mac over to my PC yet. And it's like something I'm dreading because there's like five different accounts mm-hmm. and all sorts of different mailbox things I've set up. And I'm like trying to figure out how to do this migration without it breaking the entire world and emails are just stacking up i th- I went in there i think i had 700 unread <laughs> emails from just two different accounts just the av rant and the tom at tom andrea account yep. are both uh overflowing with <laughs> love so i want to thank our listeners of the week become a listener of the week if to support the podcast in some way one of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash slash av rant podcast it's a sign up for a continuing subscription an ongoing support pledge to our podcast, a monthly support that the Patreon will take from you and give most of it to us. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank our 121 patrons over at Patreon.com. Yes, indeed. People heard our plea to uh, get us back over 120. So Patreon.com slash If You Ran Podcast, if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, and we're up to 121 patrons over there. So thank you very much, everyone, for the support. Uh, Anyone who'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal. Uh, Come to our website avrant.com and on the right hand side it says support avrant and that will take you to paypal where you can use a credit card or your paypal account there you go we want to thank uh some get some notes of gratitude for some of our listeners (laughs) from john luke dan and tate for keeping the podcast going even though or maybe especially because i wasn't there (laughs) (laughs) no no uh definitely had people saying they were missing you and happy that you're back so john (laughs) luke dan and tate appreciate the uh notes of gratitude because it's very nice to read that and uh and know that people are appreciating the effort that goes into keeping this podcast going so that is very nice to read and thank you to everyone who continues to listen and send us questions because there's no show without that so that's uh that's, that's awesome and thank you I will tell you that uh, you know one of the things that obviously we've had workers coming in out of our mm-hmm. house for the last months, forever it feels like, and uh, you know I've been extremely careful, you know wiping everything down after they leave, uh, making everybody, w- including the workers, wear masks while they're inside my house. All the kids are wearing masks. Nobody is running around, you know, licking things. <laughs> uh, but we did get a call that one of the workers who was in our home did test co- positive for COVID. Uh, the last time he was in my house was the 15th of June. Okay. It's now July, yes. for those of you that don't know, listening to this in the far future. Uh, so it's been over 14 days since he's been here. And uh, the last time he worked with any of his fellow workers was the 17th. Okay. Uh, everybody is getting tested. My entire family will get mm. tested. All the workers and everybody else is getting tested. And it it seems like we're if we would have got it, we got it, we would have had it by now. But uh, that's the sort of thing that's that's the sort of stress things that are going on. Like I, I tell people when I the very rare time that I get to talk to people outside my own home, <laughs> I'm like, you know, one of the nice things about, you know, rather than, regardless of how you feel about face masks or anything else, when you go out, it's stressful. When you come home, you get to relax. Mm, yeah, that, that hasn't been the case right, here right, right, right. for like months. Yeah, you come home and there's people closer to you in your own right, home yeah. than there are. When you go to the grocery store store sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, wearing masks constantly. I have been, I, there may be a a hoarder show about me and face masks because I have, I just can't stop ordering them. I've ordered tons. People suggested face masks. I want to thank everybody who did. Uh, Many of your emails that, that helped me with that uh, got lost in the many, many stressful things (laughs) were going on around here and all the moving around and stuff that I did, but I did read them and I did take a look at them. I have ordered many different types of masks. I found some that I really like. So, um, you know, things are going okay there, but, uh, not feeling safe in your own home is probably uh, the worst part of this yeah, whole thing. Is... And the fact that it's not going to stop for, I mean, I, I would be surprised if the kitchen alone was done by the end of August. Mm. I would be surprised if the kitchen alone it was done by the end of August. So the home theater bathroom's fixed, though. So <laughs> there's that. At least you can stay in the home theater. 
<laughs> now I can I can lock my door. You guys can't come back here no more. All right, let's get some news in here. Uh, some prices, some of our favorite amplifiers have increased. The monolith monoprice amps, which are some of our favorites because they say monolith, and it reminds me of <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, they, they have increased. They go the 2x200 goes from 1,000 to 1,100. The 3x200 goes from 1,100 to 1,250. The 5x200 goes from 1,300 to $1,500. And the 7x200 goes from 1,600 to 1,730. So all of you people who went down the rabbit hole and thought, oh, all I need is a two-channel, you know, one hundred dollar <laughs> Dayton audio amp, and ended up at Monolith. You can now look back and say, "Boy, I wish I would have not listened to Rob and Tom, and that actually gotten the Monolith before the prices increased by a marginal amount." There's also a nine-channel three by two hundred and a six by one hundred that remains at two thousand dollars, and the eleven-channel three by two hundred eight by one hundred watts remains at twenty-five hundred dollars. So. Uh, let's see here. If you want to compare them to Emotiva's amps, the two by three hundred goes for a grand. So that's two by two hundred for monolith goes for eleven hundred. That's right. So the two by three hundred is uh, more price effective over at Emotiva right now. Yep. The three by two uh, twenty seven. Okay. Two hundred seventy five. Two seventy five. I was gonna say twenty seven five. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Coffee hasn't kicked in, Rob. <laughs> I've been trying. I've been. I, I made the mistake of thinking to myself. It's mostly plug and play. I could probably just plug this camera yeah. in and plug the the, the, Dude, the mic in and everything will work. Switching operating systems is no trivial task. <laughs> three by two seventy five for twelve hundred, as opposed to three by two hundred for twelve fifty. Mm -hmm. So the most more price effective there. Yep. Five by two fifty for sixteen hundred. Now wait a second here. Yes. The five by two hundred goes for fifteen hundred. So yep. A little less power. A little less money. That's right. And the seven by two hundred from Emotiva goes for two grand. And the seven by two hundred. Uh, from uh, mono price goes for seventeen thirty. So that's right. So if you're looking for fewer channels with more power, it looks like uh, Emotiva is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for a more power uh, or more less, more channels, more channels, or, yeah, more yeah. channels, but a little bit lower cost than the monoliths, still come out on top. Uh, Emotiva uh, does have nine and eleven channel models too, except that their lower power stereo modules are only 65 watts per channel instead of 100 watts per channel like the monoliths mm -hmm. are. Uh, but their 11 channel version is only $2,000 over at Emotiva yeah. versus 2500 As opposed to 2500 yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it makes them closer to price parity between the two companies. Uh, both are American-made. Uh, the Emotivas are manufactured in North America, as are the monoliths, which are uh, made by ATI. So, yeah, uh, pretty darn close to, to even-keeled in prices now. Sweet. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Outlaw Audio has discontinued the $600 Model 5000. It's 5 by 120 watts and replaced it with a $750 Model 5000 X. <laughs> Ooh, it must be better. If it was only in the i5000X, then it would be super better. <laughs> So the 5000X has both RCA and XLR inputs. Ooh, I have to scroll this to the side here somehow. What's going on? How come it won't scroll? <laughs> Cause oh, there it goes. Because I, I don't. You gotta push the, up the, instead the, of down on Windows. The you pad, the that. pad is different mm -hmm. than the, from the Mac because yep. they've trained me for so long. <laughs> uh, the, the 500X has XLR and RCA inputs. It's still 5 by uh, 120, and the model 7000X. It's a 7x130 watts RCA and XLR inputs. Gets a very small price increase from 950 to 980 A mm -hmm. mm. little bit of Must copper price went up there or good. something. <laughs> I was going to say, somebody decided to actually gold plate something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's nice, actually, I think, that there is a five-channel model from Outlaw now with XLR inputs because there's there's really no competition for that from anybody right now uh, yeah. at, a, at a quite yeah. affordable price with both RCA and XLR because Emotiva has their base X or... Tom's favorite Bass X Bass uh, series, uh, which is a little bit less expensive for their 5 by 80 watt model, which is what you'd be getting. So it's lower wattage and lower price, but RCA inputs only. So if you're one of the people who's grabbing like uh, Monoprice's HTP1 processor with its 15 speaker channels, all of which are yeah. XLR only, they don't have any RCA outputs on that processor, uh, you know. If you want to save some money on the uh, amplifier, you get three of the 5,000 X's from Outlaw it would still be more cost effective. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a pretty good price for a five channel amp. And 120 yeah. watts is uh, more, well, 
uh, 130 was it 120 for the yeah the model 5000 is yeah. 120 watts by five but that's all channels driven simultaneously yeah yeah, yeah. or as people on the internet like to say those are real watts mm. not the fake ones <laughs> yeah fake news Andrew says the new versatile video coding or VVC or H.266 codec standard has been finalized, setting the stage for the battle between VVC and AV1 codecs. Mm -hmm. Everybody's so excited about we that. We are. We can all be excited about that. Look how excited. VVC promises 50% bandwidth savings over HEVC which is the H.265, not the 266. But having been created and patented by the MPEG and Video Coding Experts Group, there are licensing and royalty fees to be paid. AV1, by comparison, saves roughly 30% in bandwidth compared to HEVC, or VP9, which is AV1's predecessor, but is royalty-free. Mm -hmm. Apple and Microsoft are backing both codecs, but Google and Netflix have chosen AV1. AV1 is also ahead in deployments, as chips that support VVC won't be here until the fall. Dude, free always beats... <laughs> Always beats it. It doesn't matter that it's only 30% savings over 50% savings in bandwidth. Free beats it. I mean, we had HEVC, uh, H.265, yeah. which had licenses and royalties, versus VP9, uh, which was royalty-free. But VP9 arrived significantly later. So that allowed H.265 to get a real foothold for 4K streaming, which is pretty much what we're using now, except on YouTube. Of course, Google was the major backer of VP9, and they're using that on YouTube. But almost everything else uses HEVC for 4K streaming. Uh, but now that right. we're moving on to VVC uh, versus AV1, AV1 has come out ahead. It's royalty-free, but not quite as you know, bandwidth savings. So yeah, there's going to be decisions to be made there. And since Google and Netflix are backing AV1, uh, I think we're going to be seeing that for a while. Apple is backing both, which is unusual for them. So yeah, that that's what's happening. All right. Uh, <laughs> some comments here. Mike, Dan, and Andrew wanted to mention some specific titles to show off Atmos and DTSX FX. Overlord? Is that that? What movie is that? Isn't that a horror movie? Is that the, is that the one where they're, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, they're like it, oh is that the like a war is thing? that the one it's where it's thing, like right? yeah it's like um zombie nazis i think it is that's I the think one so that's too. the one yeah i started watching that one night and then got distracted by something else and stopped and i never finished it so but apparently it has good overhead effects in immersive audio uh pacific rim uprising which <laughs> If, I mean, if you absolutely have to watch a movie, th this is, in fact, a movie that has been made that can be watched by people. I mean, the first Pacific Rim was pretty darn good and had some good sound it effects. It was fun. But, yeah, the sequel. It, it was fun. Yeah, the sequel, Uprising. Not not in the same was, category no. <laughs> as a movie. I just... No, I don't doubt that I its just, overhead that, effects are impressive. I don't doubt that. I, I, will, ne I will never exp find out. <laughs> I will never experience it. It's not going to happen. And Independence Day, which I guess is the remake? No, or it's the, the, it, the, act, the original? It's recently released on Ultra HD Blu-ray, oh, okay. which is why. With a, with a okay. new, uh, I think it's DTS-X mix, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, Hamilton sounded really good. Ah. In, uh, yeah, we're going to talk I mean, about that was... a little later when we get to that question. Are we good? Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that. All right, Grinder has a picture of an amp, mm -hmm. I guess. So he received and installed an SVS Sledge 1200 amp in his PB13 Ultra subwoofer after his original Sledge 1000 amp died. Something we hadn't mentioned before is that the Sledge 1200 doesn't have any physical controls on it since the 4000 series subs have a separate front, front panel control. So his only option for controlling his sub now is his app for his phone. Thankfully, it works like a treat and physically swapping the amps was quite easy. And since once you set your subwoofer, you never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever, 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 ever have to touch it again. I would very much prefer if there weren't any knobs on mine because it, it my like my one back of my mind thing is like somebody might have touched something. <laughs> I might have touched something. Who knows? You know, a, 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 a house gecko. We call them house geckos. The lizards from outside mm -hmm. that come inside. A uh, house gecko could have like landed on it and spun the knob. I don't know. The face could be all messed up. Anyways. Being able to literally change the phase one degree at a time made him worry he would never 
be able to stop measuring, but he found that with the sub at the front of his room set to 90 degrees and the sub at the back of his room set to zero degrees, he got a graph where all of his seats were within a couple of dB of each other. It wasn't necessarily the most linear looking graph, but it was the most uniform and being able to change his sub's front setting from his phone did come in handy, so all worked out well. That is good news. Happy to hear it. And yeah, apparently it was a easy swap out and in. The, the physical size of the amps works just fine. Uh, yeah. So. I mean, it's really more about where the holes are exactly. for the screws than anything else. I yeah. mean, the fact that they thought well enough ahead mm -hmm. to make sure that that was the case. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, hadn't, I would love I hadn't, to swap out my amps for something I control with my phone. That's I hadn't sure. thought about the uh, separate little control panel. I was like, oh, yeah, that is the case on the 4000 series. And since he was a PB13 Ultra that used to have all the controls on the amp right. itself. But, uh, but yeah, thankfully he can use the app and it all still works just swimmingly well. All right, Michael wanted to share some info. Having recently received his order from Gek Acoustics, there were some significant delays in getting his order shipped due to staffing issues related to COVID. He says that they were very professional and friendly about it. They communicated clearly, and he had every opportunity to cancel his order if he didn't want to wait. But it's just worth being aware that they aren't able to ship as quickly as usual right now. Uh, it's all about communication. It man. is. Yeah. It is. People will. People will, especially if they've ordered something that they want, they will wait forever <laughs> if they know that if, if you just keep talking to them about what you're doing and why things are slowed down and, you know, where it is in the process and everything else. I mean, nothing is more irritating than going to, like, your Amazon order and seeing that it hasn't shipped mm. yet. I'm like, what the, what the heck? You know, at least if you can see it's in transit, you can be like, all right, well, it's doing something. Something's happening. Yeah. So communication is yeah. key if you're gonna if you're gonna have shipping issues or whatever. It is, is certainly key. understandable, but I do appreciate it. it's it's good to know for because I mean, obviously, we recommend them frequently around here. So it's yeah. it's just good to know that there might be a weight involved. It's for a very legitimate and understandable reason, and they will apparently communicate it with, to you. Again, I don't doubt that for a second, having dealt with Gig before myself. So, uh, but yeah, good to be right. aware of. Yeah, I like the Git guys oh, quite yeah. a bit. I mean, I don't, you know, every experience I've had with Git has been positive. Yeah. Uh, and, and from a standpoint of a, of a reviewer, because I think the main interaction I had with them was when I reviewed their try, -tra mm -hmm. try traps. You know, I mean, not everything I said about those things were positive, mm. and there was no, like, blowback. Right. And sometimes manufacturers can get <laughs> real parental about these things. Well, you mean my baby's not perfect? Your baby's not perfect, because none of them are, and your baby's ugly. <laughs> All right, but not in this case. Let's get to some questions here. Don. Don is looking to make upgrades to the, to the 5.1 system in his RV and write an article about it. And write an article about yep, it. Yep, that's what he's going to do. Okay. We, we didn't we already deal with this, this, this I, RV guy? I don't think this is the same RV person because this is a very there's two RV guys. This is a very guys. different looking setup from the previous RV it setup. It does look different. Yes. There's a lot of wood in here. <laughs> all right, uh, at the moment he has a 40 inch uh, LED LCD TV with all Polk monitor series speakers and a Tang band passive subwoofer. Tang. Tang. It's a band, like for a band. No, I, I or think Tang, Tang Band, band is, the, is the brand name, as far as I know. I I don't. I'm not familiar with it, but that is what he wrote. So that is what I wrote. Okie dokie. <laughs> Naturally, physical space is at a premium, so that greatly limits his options. Also, rerunning wires is not part of this project, so the subwoofer needs to remain passive. Don has it in mind that he would like the TV's built-in apps to essentially be the only source. There's a 50-foot HDMI cable from the 2009 uh, from 2009 already routed, with no intentions of replacing it, but it. But if all it needs to carry is the audio return channel, that should be okay, right? Uh, yeah, it sh no. Well, I mean, it, it depends on. Well, I mean, not if you, <laughs> it's from two thousand nine, yeah. right? So it's eleven years yeah. old. So there's going to be whatever bandwidth limitations it has, and it, as long as it has audio return channel, which it should, should be fine. But you might be getting nothing but five point one. Well, yeah, but it's know, only a five point one system anyway. I mean, it's right, but no lossless or no lossless. Stuff, no, it's so. going to be Dolby Digital at best, but that's that's okay. It's an RV setup. I think I think he'll survive with. I mean, it's all streaming services anyway. So at best, they're sending Dolby Digital Plus. And important to remember, this isn't the upgraded quality version of Dolby Digital Plus. It is the same quality at a lower bandwidth version of Dolby Digital Plus. So right. having that come out as regular vanilla 5.1 Dolby Digital via the audio return channel is no problem. And the original audio return channel didn't require Ethernet, which the new enhanced audio return channel does. Uh, but the original didn't, so yeah, whatever cable you've got in there, it should be okay. Should be. Right. So I'm looking at this picture, and I don't know. I know people who are not on YouTube can't see this picture, but it's where's the TV? 
Is there a TV in yeah, this picture? Yeah, straight ahead. The picture? black rectangle straight ahead. That's the TV. Oh, that. Oh, my God. I thought that was a blacked out window. Nope. That's okay. the TV with a now. little center channel. Speaker underneath. Below it. I don't yeah. know where the front left and right are. He said they're hidden behind speaker grill cloth somewhere. And I'm like, I, I don't really see where it is, but I'll take your word for it that they're at the front there somewhere. I don't know where they are. I can't see them in the photo. He says they're there. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I see this. I see the surrounds. <laughs> so the surrounds are, the surrounds are right. Uh, these little cubes there. Uh, so I see those. But I, I what speaker grill cloth is he? I don't about? know. I, believe me, man. I looked. I don't know. But that's what he said. So I'm leaving it at that. All right. Here we go. So did, did I read all the question? All right. Uh, which TV uh, the width of the available space is thirty seven point eight inches? Is there any current forty three inch model uh, that would fit and also be a good choice? Now, just so people understand, the the cabinet he has it set on mm -hmm. has a wall to the right side of it, and to the left is the walkway That's right. to you know the hallway for this place. So if you overshoot in, at all, you're gonna your TV's edges are gonna be in the walkway, which means invariably somebody is going to bump into it and spin that TV yes. and possibly knock it off of this thing. So I think it's very important that it stays within the, the width limitations that he has. Now, set. What you got, I am going to suggest uh, Samsung's QLED, uh, the current model Q60T, which I'm showing an image of it on YouTube. If you want bezels as thin as bezels get, this is it. Uh, you can't really get any thinner than that without them completely disappearing. Now, the thing is... It is a 43-inch size. He's currently got a 40, but with some bezel. Uh, so it's going up in screen size, downing the bezel. It is 37.9 inches wide. He said he has 37.8 inches. Uh, it's it's going right. to be sticking a teeny tiny little bit out in that walkway, I guess. Um, but I mean, that's so darn close. And the thing, I mean, it's a really good television, all things considered, uh, for this size class. Um, you're getting the full HDR support, and it is a it is a QLED with the full wide color. So that's the one I'll recommend to you, the Q60T from Samsung. I hope being 0.1 of an inch doesn't make it a deal breaker too large. I'm just, so he's got a passive subwoofer somewhere in here, Yeah, right? somewhere. I'm not sure where. Again, it's hidden within a cabinet somewhere. I don't like not knowing where the speaker yeah. is. Uh, he asked which AV receiver. He has enough cabinet space for a full-size receiver, but he would also need a separate amplifier for his passive sub. He would greatly prefer if it were if uh, it if powering the receiver on and off all happened automatically along with controlling his TV. So seamless HDMI CC is what he's hoping for. What do we suggest and which amplifier uh, for his passive sub as well? Um, boy, I'll tell you right now, I would rather use uh, Harmony than try to rely on the HDMI CEC to make things work. Although if uh, his TV is his only source, it should right. be it okay. It should work. It should be okay. We know. Yeah. <laughs> we always say this. It <laughs> should work. And then it doesn't work and people are like, why didn't it work? <laughs> HDMI CEC sucks. That's why. Yeah. I mean, there's just no getting around it. Um, but it should be. I would spend the extra money. I, I like, you know what I like for this? I like a uh, slim line. Of course. I'm a rant slim line. Yeah. And I don't think he's upgrading beyond five channels, so I think the NR1510, no. which is the 5.1 model, no, it yeah. doesn't decode Atmos, but you're also not going to be sending Atmos from the audio right. return channel. So uh, I think the NR1510 is a great choice. Um, yeah. I like I like shaving space. Even though even if he has exactly. the same the, the space, I would go ahead and uh, with space. Marantz's, you do want to make sure, as far as CEC goes, uh, they separate every part of CEC in the Marantz menu. So uh, it's actually in the video section, because that's where the HDMI settings are. And in there, you can set the HDMI control, the HDMI power, and the HDMI audio return channel all separately. So you'd want to turn all three of those things on, in your case, uh, to have this work as seamlessly as you can. As far as a uh, amplifier for your passive subwoofer, uh, definitely Dayton's APA 150 is where I would point you. It's a nice, compact sort of rectangle shape, and uh, you do have the option to bridge it, which is what you would do. Uh, that gives you the full 150 watts when you bridge it like that, uh, and it has a low-pass filter 
which is a great thing when connecting to a passive subwoofer driver because that allows you to filter off the high frequencies and not have to worry about that at all. So Dayton's APA 150 is a great choice for that. Uh, but yeah, getting into the next part, uh, all of that might might potentially be moot, but we'll see. Next question. <laughs> all right. What would we suggest as a speaker upgrade? One big challenge is the available space for the center speaker. There are cabinets above and below the TV, so there's really only about four inches of height for the center speaker, and the other four speakers are behind speaker cloth uh, covers within hidden cabinet spaces, so they need to be around 10 inches tall by 6.5 inches uh, square or so. What can we suggest? So I'm looking at the speakers he currently has in here, and they're you know small, very, very. small, cubish yeah. things. Um at least I think that's what those things are. Uh, I like the NHTs, the the Super Zeros. I like that for this. Even I think those that though work. is the center is more than four inches tall. It is it though? Yeah, because the the driver in that thing I think is four inches. Pretty darn sure that it's not like a three inch driver. I mean, I agree with you as far as being compact and good sound quality, but. Uh, but yeah, as far as the center goes, I don't think it's going to be small enough for this. Um, I'll go on to the point I was considering, which is I'm thinking soundbar, um, you know, because then you can have wireless surrounds and a wireless sub that comes with it. And again, we have to consider the width here. The width actually being ends up being a big consideration. Uh, but I was thinking maybe you go Sonos, uh, a Sonos beam, uh, because their new arc is too wide and actually even the old play bar is too wide for the space he has. But a Sonos beam, which is a three channel sound bar up front that is less than three inches tall. So that would certainly fit physically. And then you combine it with some little Sonos One wireless surrounds and the wireless Sonos sub, which gets you away from the whole passive sub and worrying about wires situation. Um, so, I mean, that would just be an arc cable going from the TV straight down to the little Sonos beam in front of it. And then everything else is connected wirelessly. Um, yeah. I, I think that's worth considering. What'd you find on the NHTs? Yeah, they're five and a half. Yeah. Uh... So, but I'm looking at this TV that he's got right here, and you know there is space between the t the bottom, the top of the TV, and the bottom of the cabinet. Teeny so I'm wondering bit. how much, how, yeah, how much up he can cheat that yeah. and still work this in here, because the rest of them would work quite well. Oh yeah, going Super Zeros would be really nice choice. I I I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, yeah, because they will definitely fit in the the other spaces. He's the other four yes, speakers right. behind. So he says the other four speakers are behind, but what are those little cube things? I don't know. Those are I not don't know. speakers? I, I, I'm not totally sure about it. Like I say, I couldn't see where all the speakers are in here, but um, no, I, that, that's, a, that's a good solution. Um, the other one I would suggest to you is Kef. Uh, and again, I'm kind of I'm going speaker bar here because they have uh, Kef's HTF 7003, which is only 3.1 inches high and only 30.9 inches wide. So physically it'll fit. Now that's all three of your front channels, uh, but in one bar that would sit below your television. So I'm not sure about running, because this actually takes speaker wire. Um, this isn't a sound bar. So uh, I'm not sure about getting speaker wire, uh, all you know, three channels under your TV, but doing that along with uh, their E301 surround speakers, uh, which are you know nice compact that you could place. So to me, those are very nice speakers that would physically fit, um, and then you'd still be using your passive sub. So the the prime satellite speakers are four point nine inches mm -hmm, mm -hmm, wide. Mm -hmm. If you laid those down, laid one of those down up front, yeah. you could use that for a center channel. Possibly. If five and a half is too big, can you get to four point nine? <laughs> <laughs> That would be another good solution because they're eight point seven five by four point nine by six. Okay. They're six deep. Yeah. And so that it, it fits all it clicks all the other boxes. Right. It's just that one dimension. The one dimension, so yeah. Those are the ones I suggest. All right. Whatever. All right. Michael. Michael lost the Odyssey microphone that came with his Denon X thirty five hundred H, but he has the mic that came with his X twelve hundred W. It's the model the its model number is ACM one HB. It would be okay to use that mic with this 3500H. Searching online, people are saying they are interchangeable. Uh, the only replacement Odyssey mic you can find for purchase is the, that same model number. I am imagining it probably is the same, but it, I mean, a, a quick call to Denon or Odyssey be or Denon whomever. <laughs> yeah. Sure. 
This, does they own Odyssey these days? Um, I mean, have they bought it, or is Odyssey? What is Odyssey doing? I'm not sure on the whole thing. As uh, I, the last I read about it is Denon did buy out like the perpetual licensing rights to using Odyssey and AV receivers, so it's like theirs yeah. now. That part of it, Odyssey, the company, I think, is still a separate entity. But I, as far as I know, they're only focusing on like uh, car audio stuff now. Um, so Car audio. Yeah, I, I don't know so i'm not 100 percent sure on the ownership over there but anyway um but yeah you sh it should be fine uh, like the odyssey has not changed their microphone for any of their models uh den and emirates have not changed that microphone model for any of their receiver models in yeah. years now so uh it, it should be fine yeah a quick call to denon just to double check but uh as far as i'm aware it should be absolutely fine all right, Matt. Matt went with Rob's suggestion, and he got a 75-inch Sony X900F TV. He was blown away by the size increase from 55 inches. Well, I mean, that's not just because it's Sony. As well as a picture quality. That might be because it's Sony. The only <laughs> downside is that uh, regular TV shows via his dish hopper look even worse compared to 4K HDR content with the size increase, but that's not the TV's fault. His one problem is with the audio return channel. He's using a Marantz SR6012 receiver, and much of the time when he goes to use the Sony's built-in apps, he gets no signal at all. It seems as though if he turns on the HDMI control in the Marantz and lets the Sony power everything on and off again via HDMI CEC, that seems to get uh, audio return channel working. But as soon as he switches inputs on the Sony and then goes back to the built-in apps, the, the ARC isn't working anymore. <laughs> he has seen other people complain about online about ARC issues. Mm -hmm, See mm -hmm. previous answer to previous question and why I think Harmony remotes are the way to go. He won't be changing inputs, so the previous question should be okay. It should be. Fingers should crossed. Should being the, the, the optimal word there. Is this something that can be easily fixed? <laughs> uh, HDMI and easily fixed. So funny. Uh, should he Or should he just buy a streaming stick, plug that into his receiver, and call it a deck? Uh, well, we just said something about... Oh, I, this reminds me of a story I want to tell. Yeah after this question is answered but uh yeah this just reminds me of uh the, the thing rob just said which is morantz takes uh and in cc breaks everything down individually so there's probably multiple settings you have to check on that morantz yes that might be part of the problem now almost completely the reverse of what i said uh, to Don, uh, where I was telling him to turn every individual part of HDMI CEC on uh, for his particular setup. This is one where I would suggest to you that the only thing you have on is the audio return channel, that you turn the HDMI control and the HDMI power off in your Marantz SR6012 uh, for Matt setup. Now, that would necessitate that anytime you want to use your Sony television's built-in apps, you have to manually press the TV audio button on your Marantz's remote, just like you would for any other input, right? Whenever you're switching inputs on the Marantz, you would press a button on the remote. Uh, in this case, you would press the TV audio button to activate the audio return channel manually. Because what it sounds like he's having trouble with is the automatic side of it. And yeah, it, it is problematic getting it to automatically detect and switch, which is what people want it to do, but it causes these problems. If you do it manually, it's pretty darn reliable. So uh, he must already have Bravia Sync turned on in his Sony TV uh, if it's ever working, because that's a necessity. Right. Uh, but in the Marantz, I would suggest going the manual route. So all of the HDMI control stuff, turn it off except for the audio return channel. It's the only one you would have on and then manually press TV audio just like you would any other input. It should work. Mm. It works okay on mine. So, yeah. Yeah, so the first Airbnb we stayed at, they had, uh, they had, it was like a, more modern setup and it was just a rental house. I mean, the, the people own it and they, all they do is Airbnb mm -hmm. it. So, uh, it was nice, but uh, it was clearly set up with looks in mind and not so much with functionality. The couches weren't very comfortable, but they looked mm -hmm. nice. The TV was way too high on the wall, but it looked nice. Uh, you know, there's other issues. But uh, after about three days of being there, my wife looked at me and says, what the heck's wrong with the TV? <laughs> I was like, I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, everything looks fake. All the sets look like sets. I'm like, I, I know. It's, you know, it's probably 120 you know, Hertz panel, and they probably have all the smoothing. Uh, of course and, they do. 
you know, all stuff turned on. It's, you know, the color's off. I could have told you that just, you know, when we walked in, I looked at it and went, oh, that's not right. I could have, you know, but you don't like it when I start messing with other people's CVs, <laughs> so I left it. <laughs> she got so mad at that TV. I'm like, I was like so proud, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then the second place we went to, uh, it was this itty bitty TV, and it was stuck inside of like a like literally like a like a armoire or something like that. You'd open up these little doors in this TV, and it had no speakers or anything with it. It was a TCL. It was nice. Mm -hmm. The colors were terrible, and <laughs> uh, and it you know it was inside. It, it was just very tinny, and everything was very reflective inside this armoire that it was in, and it was very far away. And at one point, she looked at me. and She goes, "I can't wait till we get home ah. to the home theater." I'm like. One good thing came out of COVID, I guess. This is it. This is the thing. That's when you wish that you were out recording that... so you could play it back. I know. I was. I... Oh my god, I was so happy when she was like, "Why does everything look stupid?" <laughs> <laughs> stupid. I'm like, uh, I said, I can do a whole podcast episode on this. We could talk about 4K and smoothing and and filmmaker know, mode I, now. <laughs> yeah. Oh right. And then uh, I said, it's you know basically you know it's the uh, soap opera. That's effect. right. You know, and so I just, you know, explained it to her, and she's like, okay. I said, well, I can fix it. She goes, no. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> All right, Brian. Brian says he's in, he enjoyed our appearances on the Bright Side Home Theater podcast. During Rob's appearance, he talked about professional display calibration and mentioned Lion AV is a good resource. So Brian reached out to them, had a great conversation with one of their affiliate calibrators who performs calibrations in Brian's home state of Indiana. But it turns out this calibrator covers the entire Midwest. And what he basically does is tour around the territory that he covers, sort of like a traveling band. So he won't be back in Indiana until September or so. Is it normal to have to wait for a calibrator in your area? Is this approach of touring around a uh, territory typical or is it possible to schedule a professional calibration in a more timely fashion well it depends on where you live yeah uh if you live in the big city there's absolutely no reason that you have to wait longer than you know, a couple of if days if you live in say your california you're going to find lots right. of professional calibrators available yeah. right uh but yes this is not only typical i i, I the two guys that were the main trainers for the thx uh video calibration class i took that's that's what mm -hmm. they did they just traveled around different areas and then they would schedule as they mm -hmm. go and go into people's houses uh it was pretty pretty typical especially in more rural areas where they're not going to have a professional calibrator nearby they need somebody you know that, that's how they make their money they go around and calibrate stuff yeah yeah that's it's not unusual certainly to, uh, to find that as as the way now i mean lion av of course is just one group of calibrators um so if you were to go directly and contact the imaging science foundation uh there might be another certified calibrator in your area uh the reason i mentioned lion av specifically is because they are a group who will vouch for the calibrators that they recommend uh, because they are, as I described on, on the Bright Side Home Theater podcast, you know, not just guys who are just going to come in, tell you to get out of the room, do what they do and get out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, they're actually going to take the time to talk to you and, um, you know, uh, give you a bit of an education along the way as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be worth it. If you're willing to do the wait, then you're going to get a good calibrator that way. And yes, we are having bandwidth issues, which is why Tom is making those expressions. I don't know if you can hear anything I'm saying, uh, but yeah, this is not unusual. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, none of that came through. <laughs> the signal was going well for quite a while and now it's red and zero. Uh, I'm just assume you're done talking. I Jay, <laughs> the digital bits uh, posted an article on Kaleidoscape, Kaleidoscape uh, about Kaleidoscape, pointing out how their library of 4K HDR titles is actually larger than the available catalog of physical Ultra HD Blu-rays, and how they create their own downloadable versions from the mezzanine files. Mezzanine? Mm -hmm. Is that how you say that? Yeah, that's think? what they call them, the mezzanine file. That they get direct. That they get directly from the studios, which often means slightly less compression and larger file sizes than the disc versions. With disc sales declining, do we agree with the author that this might end up being the replacement for collectors who want the highest quality and a system that doesn't rely on streaming? Uh, do you actually download the Kaleidoscape stuff? It's on a box in your house and you own that box and they can't 
delete stuff off of it? Is that how that well, works? Well, um, so it is download. Uh, there is no way to stream the movies that you purchase on Kaleidoscape. You do have to download them. If you're using their current Strato players, uh, that has a hard drive built into it. Uh, they also have, of course, a server uh, that you can use to expand the amount of storage that you have available. Uh, but yeah, it is all download based. But um, they don't say it explicitly on their website, but I'm pretty sure that those devices are phoning home and using some kind of DRM authentication, mainly because right. they have a marine version, because, of course, they cater to people who have private yachts and stuff like that and want to have systems installed in those where they won't necessarily have internet connections, of course. And what they do there is they have a system where you must contact your rep, your dealer, uh, for your marine version of the system, they download it onto an encrypted hard drive and deliver it to you. That's how it's handled uh. for a system that can't connect to the internet. So that to me says, I think there must they must be doing some authentication. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to have that system for the marine system. You could just download it yourself and take it with you. And that is not how it works. Right. So... Um, yeah, I mean, Kaleidoscape back in, what was it, 2015 or 2016, went bankrupt and then kind of got resurrected, uh, changed how they handle their um, studio relationships and that a little bit when they did that. Uh, you know, before when they started, you were putting in your own disks and it was ripping it to a hard drive. Uh, and that was, you know, why they were charging, you know, over $10,000 for their stuff at the time because they basically wanted their customer base to be so small that they wouldn't get sued out of existence, but they kind of did anyway. Uh, so when Blu-ray came along, they had their system where you could actually copy it onto the hard drive, but to play it back, you had to have the physical disc in a, a disc player of some sort. So they had like one of those right. giant jukebox disc players so you yeah, could yeah, yeah. store like 500 discs. And that's how they handle Blu-rays. Now with 4K, they don't, you can play back a 4K disc on a player, uh, but there's no ripping it to the hard drive whatsoever. If you want it on a hard drive, you download it from their store. Um, so, I mean, they still don't have Lionsgate at all, so there's no John Wick, there's no Hunger Games on there. Um, you can't get those movies, but they, they got Paramount. That was the other studio they didn't used to have, but they have them now. Uh, so it's really only Lionsgate that they don't have anymore. Um, the quality of the files I have I have no issue with. Uh, very often it actually is even higher quality than the Ultra HD Blu-ray. But the issue to me is, yeah, you purchase these movies directly from their store now. They have a disc-to-digital program, although it isn't every single movie. Uh, but most movies, they have a disc-to-digital program. So if you already built a physical disc collection, you can convert most of that for a fee, but a reduced fee, uh, into all Kaleidoscape. But... If they go under again, or they lose the rights to certain movies in their store, um, it certainly seems like there is a, a DRM scheme going on where it has to authenticate. Um, so it's still the instance where, you know, in the future, you might lose access to movies that you bought, uh, which discs you never, ever will. Um, you know, and then, of course, there's comparing it to something like just, you know, Apple movies. Um where that is streaming and of course they can remove a movie from their library at any given time and you don't have a downloaded version of it so kaleidoscape's a little bit superior in that sense but yeah i don't think it's it's still not as secure as having a disc yeah and i guess in the end uh that's where i am going to always uh fall on the side of I don't want to have to rely on the goodwill of a company <laughs> and their ability to stay afloat in order to, for me to have access to the things I've bought. You know, I, I don't know how else to to say that other than, yeah. you know, if you're going to spend the kind of money that you're going to spend on Kaleidoscape, I would love there to be some reassurances. Now, people who are putting these things on their yachts... You know, well, I mean, that makes all, they, you, they, you're not going to use an Apple TV on your yacht. You don't have an internet yeah, connection when yeah. you're out there. But if they if their digital library goes away, I don't know. That, I mean, they'd be irritated, but I don't know that they'd be you know like, oh my god, I wasted all this mm. money. I I uh, it would 
crush me to have wasted any money whatsoever, much less a lot, which you would have to do for Kaleidoscape. Um, yeah, it's a very yeah, so, niche crowd that Kaleidoscape appeals yeah. to because, you know, yeah. on the lower end side, you've got, hey, I'm just going to buy everything on Apple movies because their sele their selection is bigger than Kaleidoscape's. Their quality now is, is not bad. It's not as good as Kaleidoscape. I'm not claiming that, but it's by no means bad anymore. And their selection of right. 4K with HDR and Atmos is is actually even larger than Kaleidoscape's. Um, you know, so that's on the one side, but of course you are streaming it. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got, you know, continuing to buy physical discs. But yeah, that is that is starting to die out in a pretty heavy way now. Nobody's made a new Ultra HD Blu-ray player model in a couple of years at this point. Um, so yeah, it, this is the high-end one. They've got the extra things like metadata where if you have a system with four-way uh, motorized masking, they've actually got the metadata for the exact aspect mm -hmm. ratio of that movie that can tie into that system and move the masking for you to the exactly the perfect shape, uh, which is something you can kind of do with like a, a Cody plugin, you know, <laughs> if you want to rip your own movies and do it that way. But, you know, it's all pre-programmed for you. So, yeah, it's a pretty niche crowd, and I think they're kind of squeezed on either end. Um, right. And, and it only appeals to a pretty small crowd. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if they can get to the point where... Yeah, you can just download the movie and own it forever and get down to a price point that would appeal to like me specifically. Um, right. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's a challenge. It is. And, you know, that, that it's very hard for me to justify the kind of money. And Apple, at the very least, doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. It's going to take It doesn't a mean lot. that they could. <laughs> well, you would think, but it doesn't, you know, I've seen bigger... Well, maybe not bigger, but I've seen big companies go from top of the world to bankrupt right. in a matter of months. And of course, with the, their movie stores, you know, with some bad actors. Their movie store is just one very small part of their business, so right. that that right. could be something they shut down or sell off completely independent of the rest of the well, That's why I don't buy anything from Google, right. the Google store. I mean, Google kills products like it's some sort of competition it is really the hunger games has... over there in their app store it's just you know not apps but the apps that the things that they develop you never know what's going to get killed I, I don't know how the employees feel about that right. but i know i would that would find that extremely how's that stressful stadia too. library yeah. going for you yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. That lasted what, like five and a half yeah, apparently seconds. Apparently, it's still before... going. But like Samsung, yeah, Samsung shut so. down their uh, Gear VR. You know, they had Gear VR for a while over at Samsung. They shut it down, and all the games you bought, they don't work anymore. They're just gone. Right. <laughs> All right, Joe. Joe has a Denon X4300H, which has nine amplifiers built in. He is currently running a 7.1 configuration and now considering upgrading, ups, expanding to Atmos. What would sound better, 7.1.2? Or just correct connecting his surround back speakers and going with 5.1.4, or should he replace his 4300H with 11 channel receiver model instead? I would go for 5.1.4 uh, to see if you loved it. And if you loved it and really missed your surround back speakers, then I would upgrade your receiver. Except you uh, don't. If you didn't, if you. Go ahead. You don't have to upgrade your receiver. You could just add a two-channel amplifier because the 4300H... Oh, that's right. This is the 4300H. Yeah, the yeah, 4300H, yeah. while it has nine amplifiers built in, it does have the ability to process 11 speakers. Uh, it has 11 speaker pre-outs. Uh, so you can just add an right. inexpensive two-channel amplifier and expand back up to 11 speakers if you wanted to. So uh, that that's... Yeah. I, I don't think Joe was aware of that, so that's definitely a good thing to be aware You don't have to buy a whole right, new right. receiver. I forgot about that. Yeah, uh, but I, I would... I mean, I will always say to go for four overhead speakers if you're going to do it um, and you have a receiver that can do so because otherwise you don't get front to back panning. You only get side to side. Um, so yeah. to get the full experience, I want four overheads. I mean, 5.1.4. And if you're exactly. like, oh, my God, surround back speakers. Yeah. Where are you? I miss you. I love you so much. I'll then buy an amp. That's right. And a couple more speakers. Ken. Ken would like to add a center uh, speaker to his setup. He's using Paradigm on-wall speakers that are now a discontinued model, the Studio Series Esprit V4 and a Cherry Finish. Esprit. I don't think the Cherry it's Finish. Esprit. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> the Cherry Finish doesn't add much to it. He would like to like the center to also be on an all-wall on wall model. If it could have a matching share, Cherry Finish, that would be ideal, but a Black Finish is also fine. In Paradigm's current lineup, their on-wall options are the custom-made Decor series or the Millennia series that have been around for a while. The Millennia series actually uses nearly identical drivers to the Studio Esprit <laughs> speakers. 
albeit smaller diameters, and he would be able to get a Millennia 20 center at a good price. The only hang-up is that the stated frequency response is plus or minus 2 dB from 110 to 20 kilohertz, and the paradigm's uh, stated DIN low end extension is 77 hertz. Which is basically the minus 10 decibel point. They yeah, still put the that DIN, in their paradigm does. The DIN is so terrible. It's just a terrible... Do the only one who reports it is them. Pretty much. Terrible. Ken is used to setting his crossover to 80 hertz, but if, you, if the specs are correct, he might have to use a higher crossover for the Millennia 20 center right. Will he be missing much by not having center play all the way down to 80? Is this the right center speaker to get, or would we recommend something else more highly? I am okay with this. I don't. First of all, that DIN doesn't really tell you anything. <laughs> the plus or minus 2 dB from 110 to 20 is way more informative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but that being said, I don't really think that your center channel needs to be dipping all the way down to 80 hertz to begin with. There's not a ton of content in my mind that's that low coming from your center channel. And even if there is, it's also coming from your left and right channels. So, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, Paradigm speakers sound more similar than this similar mm. as you go around their line so just just buying another paradigm speaker would is an easy fix for your your problem but many of the speaker brands that we recommend uh, includes uh you know svs rbh uh Aperion, uh, uh ascend ascend that's the other a1 <laughs> the, all those you know the kef maybe not kef as much but all those are very linear speakers mm -hmm. and they would play nice so if you see something in those lines and you're like that's that looks better that's the kind of one i want right there um and you said that you were going to do that i would be okay with it but it's very easy for if you can get the millennia 20 center at a good price mm -hmm. i would probably just do that yeah uh and i mean they're not talking about i mean if this was like oh it rolls off at 200 hertz i might be, nah, i might squinch my face at that yeah. but like you know plus minus yeah. 2 db not even 3 db 2 db yeah um you know so you're probably going to end up with a 100 maybe a 110 hertz crossover that that's not so high that it's anything i'm concerned about I would even say particularly in the center because like Tom said, yeah. the bass sounds are more in the front left and right channels than they are in the center. So I don't see any problem with that. Um, it has almost an identical tweeter to what you're using now. So the, the and paradigm is very neutral across the board. So the odds of it having any sort of timbre mismatch are very, very low. Uh, and then, yeah, right. in all those other speaker brands that we talked about, I mean, I guess RBH has the Ultra One series, but it's like it's chunkier and more expensive. So there's not a huge yeah. reason to do that. Ascend has their HTM 200 SE or their Sierra Luna, but like I'm not sure that the ribbon tweeter is like what you really want to put in here. And then the HTM 200 SE is like a, a boxier design. It's only six inches front to back, but it's boxier. So I think the Millennia 20 is a very, very good choice, and I don't have any issue with it potentially being crossed over like 20 hertz higher. Right. I'm with you. Luke. Luke is a fan of both 3D and front-wide speakers. Get out. Sorry. <laughs> this is the place You're to come. You're not welcome here. the only place to come to talk about such things. <laughs> we the, All those people had to move to Canada. Sorry. That's <laughs> why so Rob's up there. He's originally from uh, Florida. <laughs> if that were true, it would be right, escaping Luke. the heat. That I would have done that. Yeah, I wish I could escape the heat. So Luke is a fan of both 3D and front white speakers, but he feels that both technologies are underappreciated. No, I don't think that's the case. I think you overappreciate them, but that's, you know, you know, tomato, tomato, whatever. He gets the impression that we consider 3D to be a dying format. Oh, it's not just us. <laughs> Pretty much the entire world. Let's go on. Rather than a developing one, but he has watched several movies at home in both their 4K HDR version on his uh, Vizio P series and his 3D on his Epson 2040 projector. He uses uh, Alita Battle Angel as a prime example where the 3D version was more enjoyable and immersive and also a more effective film as the 3D truly enhanced the storytelling. More movies are still released in 3D in theaters. As long as they're still theaters, so let's <laughs> cross our fingers on that one. And with bright 4K resolution displays at home, the technology exists to make the 3D experience better than ever. So Luke wants to know why we think or don't think 3D could or should have a resurgence in the home market. People don't like it. That's the that's the that's the beginning of the discussion and the end of the discussion. People don't like it. They don't like wearing the glasses. Many people get motion sickness. A lot of people find find it distracting. It is so often the case that it is not well implemented 
to the point of distraction, I'll point you towards the first Avengers movie <laughs> as being a perfect example of, oh my God, look, they remember that it was 3D. Woo, things are flying. Okay, now we're back to 2D again. Although right, the whatever. last ones, Infinity War and Endgame, were some of the best 3D conversion. So It's fine. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I'll never see them that way. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I... I you're, you're, there's not, there's, what you're saying is not incorrect. It could be a, uh, and should be, one could argue, a uh, format that would be the most preferable. It's the most lifelike. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of the reasons why uh, models and actors and actresses, uh, I guess they're all actors. I shouldn't say actresses, uh, are so thin, <laughs> and are always, you know, are, you know, when you see them in real life, you're like, oh my god, yeah. eat a sandwich. I mean, they Skeletal. are, they look skeletal right i saw daryl hannah one time in a verizon store when i was in uh when i lived in la and i thought she she might just pass out <laughs> she might die right now i mean that's how thin she was but the one of the reasons they are is because of 2d yeah you know seeing something in 2d you get no sense of you know what their actual dimensions are so you know they say, say the camera ad adds 10 pounds what that really is is the fact that you can't really tell how people actually look in real life yeah. so they have to be extra thin in order to look just normally thin <laughs> you know kind of healthy to you so i i absolutely agree that 3d could be and maybe arguably should be the the best way to uh enjoy the, the content that we all love so much but the implementation and the execution of how you have to experience 3D is such and has always been such that people don't like it. And I'm with them. So uh, you're, you, sir, need to start looking towards VR and uh, any sort of VR uh, experience. There is where your 3D will once again mm -hmm. reign supreme. When we start transitioning from you know, sitting down in front of a screen with other people, which, I mean, we're not doing that anymore anyways, unless they're your personal <laughs> family, uh, to sitting down virtually with people in a virtual environment with VR, you know, ex in a VR experience, I think then 3D will once again be the the currency of, of the land. Now, I mean, the reason that I, I, so I'm a 3D fan, I remain a fan, uh, one of the last ones, but uh, the reason I'm willing to say, yeah, it's absolutely dying if not outright dead in the home market is there are no current 3d televisions flat panels right. none being made yes it still exists in projectors but that's the only way to get it at home anymore um and the number of 3d discs that are available is dwindling i mean in north america there's almost none you have to import them from the uk most of the time to get the 3d version now because they're still releasing them in europe for some reason but very few in north america so i mean there's no question that as a format at home is just largely dead already um you know i agree with you that with like when oleds came out 4k oleds there was like the la the 6 series was like the last series that had passive 3d and you had the brightness of oled and the 4k resolution so skipping every other line per eye was no problem you still got 1080p per eye with the passive version which is the best version we ever had a 3d and then but it didn't have like the dynamic tone mapping and it didn't have the maximum brightness that we got the very next year in the 7 series oleds but then the 7 series oleds all dropped 3d and i absolutely lamented that because i was like we finally got the perfect display technology for the best looking 3d ever and that's the year they dropped 3d and i was like oh it was so close so i completely am with you i lament it but uh yeah it's it's not coming back and companies are so darn stupid that they completely shot themselves in the foot with all the incompatible 3d glasses if they had gotten together yep. and had one standard it, it yep. might have had a better chance but they'll do it again because they remain that stupid look at all the hollywood studios are said we've all got our own individual streaming services now and none of them are compatible with each other like they just they that's what they do they do it again so i have no faith no oh, i mean there's the format wars are just what happens yeah. and the, the format might be a cable the format might be a streaming service i mean i look at some of these streaming services i, I would love to watch picard i am not signing up for cbs, CBS. all access I'm, I'm just not i'm not doing it i don't care about anything else that's on there and i haven't heard that you know picard is like the best thing that's everybody's like yeah it starts off really strong and then kind of gets <laughs> weird at the end i'm like okay well great not still not getting it um you know well, I'll go on and, and read the next question sure. in a second here, but uh, there's just, 
you know, we all have the things that we really love that we don't understand why other people don't love it as much as we love sure. it. And that's just the way people are. You know, there's things, I mean, I love horror movies. I absolutely love, I mean, I'll, I'll sit down and watch a bad horror movie any day before I'll watch a good, you know, murder mystery. I, I just, I just love horror movies. I don't understand why other people don't like them, <laughs> but they don't. <laughs> Uh, I'm inferring this a bit, but I think Luke is is perhaps of the mind that, you know, we're a group of people who are very passionate about home theater. And I think he's thinking, hey, if we advocate for it and get more people on board, that'll increase demand, perhaps to the point that it could like, no, you I, are I, overestimating our reach, I've, well, sure. there's that. But it's like I, I've been around long enough talking, you know, home theater forums before I got into podcasting. And, you know, like back when it was HD DVD versus Blu-ray. And it's like there right. were legitimately good arguments for HD DVD on a technical side. Why it had oh, advantages yes but yes. I, I was like from as soon as all the studios were on blu-ray and only a handful were on hd dvd on the forums i was telling everybody i'm like it's over go get blu-ray and i was I, at that point yeah. i had accumulated a couple hundred hd dvds it's not like i was against the format and there were a couple of guys there who were like no you gotta keep you know like if we increase the number of hd i'm like no it's over you gotta be realistic and i'm sorry 3d right. at home is it's over <laughs> So Luke has been using front wide speakers for a few years now, and, and what he appreciates is how they expand the width of the front sound stage. He appreciates this for both movies and music. He's heard while he's heard Rob say that he's a fan of front wise. Mm -hmm. He's also heard him say that he what that he thinks what they as uh, subtle as though that is undesirable. I think you're reading too much into yeah, it. Yeah, I think that's on. a misinterpretation of of what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he hasn't heard Tom advocate for front wides at all. It's not entirely true, but probably accurate based on the number of times you listen to the podcast. Luke's opinion is that ideally front wide should be the first additional pair of speakers added beyond 5.1. But he also strongly feels that if someone finds their surround backs or Atmos speakers to be virtually useless, then those speaker positions aren't working as intended in that person's system. But even with that said, he thinks front wides make a bigger, more worthwhile difference than surround backs or Atmos speakers. So what are our thoughts on all of that? So just so we're all on the same page here. I don't care about front wides. Okay. I mean, I, I don't hate or not hate them. I just don't care about them. They're, I am indifferent to them. And not because I think positive or negative about them. I think realistic about them. Mm. All right. First of all, uh, most people don't need their soundstage expanded. What they really, what front wides really do is what you're supposed to do is put them right where the first reflection mm -hmm. point would be on your wall and then that speaker then controls that first reflection point gives you you know uh that wider sound stage it it, it it controls that okay that's what it's kind of supposed to do <laughs> now do people set them up correctly i don't know uh do people need uh, a larger front sound stage mostly no uh will people put more speakers in their system no <laughs> we have a hard enough time getting people to go past the tv right. and a sound bar right. much less getting to 5.1 and then two front two front wides and then surround backs and then four overhead atmos speakers up to six atmos speakers and uh, you know <laughs> it's you know it's a realistic look at this thing front wides you know we tried them they tried to sell them to us and some people tried them and advocated for them. And most people like me literally do not have the space for them. Yeah. That's a big, big part I, of it. I, I just, there is no front wide space. It would be within inches of mm. my, my front speakers. So what would, I mean, do I really need another speaker right there? <laughs> I, mean, I can't imagine how much difference it could possibly make. Now it might be, you know, big, but you know, my sound stage goes from outside my room on my right to outside my room on the left. Like I can hear sounds going through the room mm -hmm. the entire way across my front sound stage when I do two channel listening tasks. Does it need to be bigger than that? I really don't feel like it does. Yeah, it's the, so, the logistics while you, of front wides are a challenge. Yeah. And I think. Yeah. Well, Sorry, go ahead. Well, he may, he may, you may have a uh, very positive experience with them, and that's great. And that's why they're there. That's why we still have them around for people who want to use them. For most people, they are both impractical and unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mainly think the logistics, because I mean, a lot of people have a, an entrance right where the front wide speaker would go or an opening, right. an L-shaped room. So there's that aspect of it. Um, I mean, even when there were more models that had the option of using front wides, it was higher priced models. It never made its way down to the entry level right. or even the mid 
level receivers at any point. So you had to already be going for a higher priced receiver for it to even be an option. Um, People do tend to want to have content that is specifically made to use the speakers that they have. There were a grand total of three titles that ever came out that specifically had soundtracks to make use of front wide speakers. Um, you know, so there, there was a lot going on there. Now, again, I'm like the advocate for it. I, you know, he's, he's writing to this podcast because we're one of the few that ever even talks about front wides as if they exist whatsoever. And I'm a fan of them. I opted to get rid of surround backs to have front wides instead in my own system. That's how much I like them. So yeah, you're talking to the right person when it comes to front wides, but I don't want to make people feel as though if you don't have them, it's the end of the world because it isn't. It just flat out isn't the end of the world if you don't have them. I think they make a nice enhancement enough that I chose them over surround backs. So yeah, I'm absolutely an advocate for them as well. Uh, but yeah, I think I, you have to just be realistic about the logistics of it in people's systems. Yeah. If we were tasked with convincing someone to use front wides, what would be our arguments for them? Uh, do you really want to spend some more money? <laughs> have you have you already bought everything else and you're just like, I just want to do something different in here? Then that's that's pretty much how I would convince. I, I don't have a, a convincing reason why front wides are needed. Uh, I can't think of a reason why you would need front wides. <laughs> I can think of a reason why you might want okay. them. Uh, but uh, and mostly it's just like, you know, I want to expand my front soundstage a little bit. I've got this really wide room and, you know, uh, I've, I've got room treatments everywhere and I would, you know, I, I have the space over here, you know, would ha adding more speakers expand my soundstage? Well, it might a little bit, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I got, I really, I really, I, you would have to, I, I, you would have to convince me you wanted them and I'd be like, Okay, I give you permission. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to me, the argument for front wides is exactly the arguments that Odyssey DSX and DTS Neo X made when it came out, which is that we do flat out hear better in front of us than behind us, right. above us. Um, so it makes more sense. We are we are better at picking out things directionally and just generally better hearing in front of us. So their whole concept was, hey, put more speakers in front of you than behind you or above you. That's where the idea first came from. And yes, when something is panning around the room, it fills in that gap in between, especially if you have a 5.1 system where the surround speaker is not at 9 degrees, but instead at 110 degrees, so some distance behind you. It fills in that gap that is that is there between the front left speaker and the surround left speaker, say. When that pan happens, it, it fills... I, I, that's why I like them. I love them for that. When I get that circling pan, it completely fills that in. It's seamless. It really is seamless. Um, so yeah, that's that's the argument there that we hear better in front of us than we do behind us. So what is the barrier that is preventing AV manufacturers from allowing users to select front wides instead of surround backs or a pair of height speakers in a 7.1 receiver model? We can typically already reassign those speaker outputs to the B backs. Heights are zone two. So why not have the option to make them front wides as well? And why on earth did Denon and Marantz Ankyo remove front wides from the vast majority of their models when they used to have them in years past? No one. I, 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 market research yeah. would probably be the answer to it that. It really was. They probably asked all their customers, you know, what speakers do you use? And when they asked them, do you use front wides? They said, what? And that was the end of that. They're like, why would we put any more of our dollars into making this a thing when no one's using it? Yeah, I mean, they... So why do you see it in the higher level receivers? Because in the higher level receivers, you've got those more niche people who are willing to buy the more expensive processors and receivers, and they're more likely to have uh, a desire to have that. Uh, front wide experience. Well, heck, when the X8500H got uh, introduced, it was the return of front wides. There was one, if not two yeah. years, where there were no models with front wides whatsoever. And when that flagship came back, it was the return of front wides. And I got all excited about it and made a Facebook post about it. So, yes, I, uh -huh. I am once again still the fan of front wides. Uh, but yeah, they, I mean, on receivers, they have that little thing where it says, you know, can we collect information about how you use your receiver? And uh, so I usually say no to that. But all the people who said yes, I, I don't think any of them were using front wides. So the information that uh, those receiver manufacturers got back from uh, that kind of data collection was that that nobody's using those positions. And, and I believe right. that to be the case. Um, 
yeah, the option of like you got a seven channel receiver, those those two binding posts are typically assignable as backs or heights or zone two. Why front wides couldn't be an option. Um I really don't know. I don't have a good answer to that. I, it should be possible. It's just a matter of, like, they they kind of dropped Odyssey DSX altogether, which was one of the ways you could right. matrix front wides. It's pretty much only the DTS up mixers that have it now. Now, if you already have a DTS Neural X up mixer, which you would on a seven channel receiver these days, why it wouldn't be able to use front wides as the assignment instead of surround backs? The, there's no real technical reason why that couldn't be the case, but uh, it's just not well, something they do. I mean, I think the reason is is because there will be instances when your receiver will be, sh you know, uh, switched into a automatic surround sound mm. setting like Atmos, where those speakers would then be excluded. They are not yeah. used at That's all. True. So in, in able for in order for them to. Uh, make these speakers assignable they don't want to have to field calls that say <laughs> i made I, I have these front wides and i set them up and they never play because well, it would really they're, only they're, they're be working. dts neural x that'd be the only one if you're using that'd be the Dolby only surround one. up mixer yeah. they'll never make a peep so yeah. yeah and i think that uh you know without the surround up mixers and the other uh, the other options they either have to find a way of doing it themselves which is going to cost mm. money or they just don't enable it because they don't. It's not worth it to yeah. them. I mean, why would you? So, on to some different topics. Apparently, he hasn't asked enough questions. So here we go. Why do we consider it to be desirable to elevate surround speakers when the two feet? He's under the assumption that Dolby changed their guidelines and now says to have them at ear level because having them elevated made them sound more diffuse. And now with Atmos, diffuse surrounds are no longer desirable. Is you wrong about that? Yeah, diffusion doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, the, you know, elevating the speaker doesn't really make it sound more diffuse. It puts you off axis a little bit. But the, uh, you know, the way that they have these, uh, the the s diagrams is they have all the speakers now at ear mm -hmm. level. And if you read all their stuff, they're like, oh yeah, we've always had them at ear level. No, you haven't. Shut up. But they are also not like more than one person in the yeah. room. <laughs> you know, you know. So we say elevate it because we want everybody to have a direct line of sight from their ear to the each speaker. Mm -hmm. And that way, you're not getting the sound, th you know, that's being uh, absorbed essentially <laughs> by the people sitting next to you. So that's why we say elevate it. Uh, I I think that if you sat down with a Dolby or DTS right. person and said, you know, should I put it like right at my shoulder or should I elevate it so that everybody on the couch has a, a line of sight, they would say the last. And we're only saying one to two feet. We're not saying put it five feet above your head where, right. yeah, if it was what we used to five say. feet and not angled downward whatsoever, you could end up with it being diffuse because it's like none of it is coming directly at you. It's all reflecting around your room at that point. But we're like, no, one or two feet simply because that allows a clear line of sight to each listener. If there's literally only one listener, I don't have a problem having it at ear level because there's nothing going to be obstructing between the speaker and you unless you have a high back chair. Uh, then you'd want to elevate it enough to get over the back of your chair. So that that's all yeah. it is. So he ran Odyssey Multi QXT32 on his Denon X4200W and playing Blu ray disc with the master volume set to 0 dB. Everything does seem to sound correct, but other sources don't all seem to adhere to the same volume. For example, playing Spotify via his Chromecast, he needs to turn the volume down to about negative 13 dB, otherwise, it is too loud. So we've mentioned uh, reference volume and Blu-ray does seem to adhere to it for the most part, but what are the technical specifications of reference volume and why don't other devices and sources adhere to it? I don't know why they don't adhere to it, mm. but I, I think that it's just a, you know, it, it essentially it's an output, like a, a you know, their base output level is just higher or lower. And we've talked about this oodles of times, but even within like the Xbox One, which, you know, when you play the disc, you can set the volume to something mm -hmm. and then you you turn to the YouTube app and suddenly it's way too loud and you go to the Hulu app and it's way too quiet and you go to this other thing and it's, you know, you know not the same. It's all, you know, within the same device, mm -hmm. you know, the apps are, have different, you know, base volumes. Why is it like that? Because reference volume isn't a law. No, <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, it, it, it's a standard by which movies are supposed to be uh, mastered, but nobody else has to master it that way. And that's why commercials are, uh, you know, 10 dB louder than the shows they surround uh, for that exact reason. Yeah, so, reference volume, actually, it yeah. was came from THX. It used to be referred to as THX reference volume, uh, but it really is only for movies. And I mean, the technical specs are average output level of 85 decibels with peaks in any of the speaker channels as much as 105 decibels and peaks 
could go as loud in the dedicated low frequency effects channel as 115 dB. That's the technical specs for THX reference volume, but it's only for movies. Uh, so, I mean, he was giving the example of Spotify. That's music. They don't adhere to movie reference volume. It's not right, something they right. do. It's very typical for uh, music to be 20 decibels louder than movies um, and have peaks that go up as high as 120 dB because that's as loud as a full-on rock concert in a stadium might get is 120. And some people are like, I must have my home experience be just as loud as the actual rock concert where my ears are literally right. literally ringing afterwards so yeah right. it, it's not a law it's only for movies that that's about it uh now the solution there is uh if you use a separate device for each source that you're going to um your av receiver has right. the input offset it'll be part of the volume settings where you can increase or decrease a given input uh, an amount so that it isn't wildly louder or quieter than the rest of your sources. But if you're using one source like an Apple TV 4K or an Xbox to play multiple different sources, they each source might be at a different uh, volume level. Right. Odyssey offers dynamic EQ and dynamic volume, and we've described how dynamic EQ aims to keep up the frequencies audible when you lower the master volume. But for a case like Spotify VS Chromecast, it isn't actually isn't it actually boosting the bass too much since the since to get the average volume level down to 85 dB to begin with, he has to lower the master volume. Do these different volume levels between your devices and sources not present a challenge for using dynamic EQ? And also, what happens if you turn the master volume above 0 dB? <laughs> does dynamic EQ do anything to the signal at that point? Above 0 dB, it does nothing. It should do nothing. Yeah. Uh, but for the other things... You could make, I mean, I don't really know exactly how Odyssey would work with something that whose volume isn't doing anything. But, uh, you know, as you lower the, I mean, I, the, the volume is, is higher than what you expect mm -hmm. it to be uh, and lowering it. I have not noticed subjectively that when something tends to be loud, I, you know, lower the volume and suddenly the bass is way too high, which is what you're suggesting. Uh you know, or vice versa, if something's too quiet and I raise the volume, it's, you know, now I have no bass. Uh, it seems to still work pretty well, keeping things all even yeah. within what's going on there. And that's probably because what it's doing is not as dramatic as people tend to think it, <laughs> it is. It only it's aims to like keep this. things audible. So, right. I mean, if you turn something way down, then yeah, the bass just being audible is going to be significantly higher in sound pressure level than other uh, frequencies if you've turned the volume level way down. Um, but I mean, this is exactly what the reference level offset uh, within Dynamic EQ is for. Uh, for music sources where it is common for them to be 5, 10, 15 decibels louder than movie reference level, that's exactly what the reference level offset uh, in dynamic EQ is for that allows you to make it so that uh, if, at the 5, 10, or 15 setting for the reference level offset, it's saying if I turn it down to 5, it doesn't do anything until I get below 5. Or if I set it to 10, it doesn't do anything until I get below right. minus 10 on the master volume or 15. Nothing until I get below minus 15. So that's what it's for is for music sources. And again, if you combine that with the input um, volume level of the AV receiver, you can sort of even this out with the caveat being different sources on the same piece of hardware, uh, you know, if they are different volume levels. Still going on. I've been, I've forgotten his name. I know. Name. <laughs> he had this? a ton of questions. I'm like, we may as well just get through them because we, we cleared out our list last I week. I mean, we're, we're down to H. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyways, we sometimes use the words or abbreviations volume, DB, and SPL interchangeably. Are they technically different things? SPL is sound pressure mm -hmm. level. That's the 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 sat, the pressure of the air moving you know against your eardrum or something db is a measure of that right of so i mean decibels is just a scale it is just a log yeah. logarithmic scale technically every time we talk about decibels in reference to audio uh how loud audio is we should be saying decibels spl because db should mm -hmm. always be followed by what it is that you're talking about. dB just means this logarithmic scale. Uh, it just stands right. for decibels. So yeah, we should technically be saying dB SPL, but we shorten it because we're we're just talking about Everybody audio. Knows what we're and talking volume about. is, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's... Volume is just su subjective. Yeah. It's just your subjective. A lot of times you're saying, oh, the volume is too high. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, you're, that's not a measure. You are measuring <laughs> the volume level of audio in decibels SPL, SPL standing for sound pressure level. 
So if he goes to the settings in his den and he goes to the audio section, there's an adjustment called subwoofer level. So I'm simply turning it from off to on makes his bass way louder. He didn't touch the associated slider. He left that at default zero dB. So why does bass get so much louder just by turning the setting to on? Audio section is a subwoofer Yes, yeah, so level. this is the yeah. thing that is input by input is. and allows you to have uh, a different subwoofer level versus the global trim level that was set with your manual speaker settings or set during Odyssey auto setup. I will... Almost guarantee, because this is the only way this would be what he's describing, uh, that your trim level for your subwoofer in like your speaker settings must be at a negative number. Uh, so when you did your Odyssey auto setup, or if you manually set the trim level for your subwoofer, right. it must be at a negative number. Once you just turn this on and it goes to zero dB, that would be higher than the negative number that's set in your global trim. But this overrides it only for the input that you're on when you make this setting. So that would be the explanation. <laughs> okay, we're up to. Jay. I know two more. We're almost scroll, done. Scroll up to the top here. <laughs> Luke is his name. Going back down to Jay. Luke. <laughs> that's all right. That's what we're here for. We're on Jay, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. He'd like to add a compact subwoofer in his kitchen where he uses a pair of Kef Q150 speakers. He's got space that's basically a one foot cube, but if the sub could be actually flatter, that would work nicely for his space. Any suggestions? A kitchen with a one foot cube. Although he said it, it's fine subwoofer. if like the, the depth and width is more than one foot, but it can't be more than one foot high. That was the only oh, real is restriction. That what it is? Yeah. Uh, there used to be like a Sunfire one that was like a one foot cube. I think if I remember correctly, <laughs> way back in the day, thing was like two thousand dollars and had like a ridiculously large amp in it in order to try to do something with it. But uh, yeah, I think you just, what you really are looking for here is just a base module, essentially. And well, I don't know, Rob, what you got? Uh, so I'm going to point you over to Monoprice, where they have their SSW subwoofers. They have an eight-inch version, they have a ten-inch version, and they have a twelve-inch version. Of course, they go up in physical size, so get the one that physically fits. Uh, but the twelve-inch version genuinely plays down to about thirty hertz, which for music. I shouldn't have to go much lower than that for music. Uh, mm. So yeah, these are a nice, very flat uh, setup. You can actually uh, wall mount them even if you want to, like kind of flat against the wall. They've got brackets that go up there. But yeah, the SSW 8, 10, or 12 from Monoprice. Uh, these are basically clones of Dayton Audio had some very similar ones, uh, but Parts Express only sells the 10-inch version at a higher price than the Monoprice 10-inch version. So there's not much reason mm. to go elsewhere than Monoprice for this. Yes, is there some PC software that would let him see the frequent response of his music file so that he can objectively know the lowest frequency in that piece of music? Well, the what I used to audit, edit the podcast will do everything. I don't know how to do this exactly, but Odyssey, it's uh, Audacity. Uh, Audacity. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying Odyssey so many times, it just comes out. <laughs> uh, Audacity is the free software that you can download. Uh, and it should be able to do whatever you it need. It can. You, uh, so you would import the music file into Audacity. Uh, then you would highlight uh, the section of the music that you want to see the frequency range of that. And then you would just click the Analyze tab at the top and say Plot Spectrum. And it will show you uh, all the frequencies and how loud each of those frequencies get in a graph uh, for whatever section you've highlighted of that audio file. Analyze Plot Spectrum. Okay. All right. Finally on to different person here dan dan is uh using a 65 inch sony z9d he heard us mention that some sony displays have issues with dolby vision which models are affected would it be better to just stick with the hdr 10 on his z9d or i'm sorry z9d <laughs> it is for, for me so that rob understands even i say z9d because i know that's what people will say uh i like saying h though i do <laughs> i don't say h. h that's a that's a UK oh thing. australia h was the was all okay. the rage i love saying h i feel like i'm insulting somebody every time i say it i love it um so it's pretty much only the sony oleds that have the dolby vision issue where everything just looks too dark all the time uh their lcd tvs don't seem to have this problem with dolby vision so uh your z9d is fine mine is as far as dolby vision goes so he's considering a screen size upgrade to 77 or 75 inches he's currently got a 65. Mm -hmm. When he got his Z9D, he felt it was the very best display he could find at the time. He continued to look at other displays since, but as far as LCD TV goes, he doesn't think he's seen anything that looks better. Would we agree with that, or are there 
or is there a current LCD TV that is an obvious upgrade these days? And then, of course, there is OLED. He hasn't been able to tell a clear winner between Sony or LG there. So would be so. What would be our top pick for a 77 or 75 inch TV to replace a Z9D? Uh, well, OLED. Yeah, yeah. A 77 inch <laughs> OLED, OLED would be, for sure. <laughs> uh, OLED would be the the uh, the only upgrade that the Sony's and the Samsung's uh, LCDs are. Very, very mm-hmm. good. The, I think the Sony's seem, unless you're a gamer, seem to be uh, the 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 creme de la creme of LCD TVs these days. But OLED is just a better technology in it, it, well, not every way, but in it many ways. It just looks better. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So gaming yeah. is the big thing where there are differences for sure. The the Z nine D was not a bad gaming. Uh, um, display but i mean it's it's input lag was i think over 40 milliseconds and now we're down into single digits um and of course being uh, as old as it is it doesn't have variable refresh rate or the ability to show right. uh 4k at 120 hertz it just doesn't have the input for that so if you're a hardcore gamer and you want the fastest refresh rate and variable refresh rate and the lowest input lag there are displays that are objectively superior to the z9d now in that way but in terms of performance for movies i agree with you i don't think anything has really gotten better because it was the only one sony ever made with the full um master backlight display where they had like 800 local dimming zones which is like that's as much as anybody has ever gone up to and nobody has ever surpassed it so yeah on that front i don't think there's anything that really looks significantly better even today all these years later but oled can look better um the only thing of course is you won't have 3d anymore that you know that was the reason i've still got a z9d is that it is the last one that can do all the things 4k and hdr and 3d but just not the gaming side of it uh with variable refresh rates so yeah uh i would get a c9 77 inch oled they are down to four thousand dollars now which is still a lot of money but for a 77 inch oled that's pretty good and the c9 in my opinion is superior to the new c10 the cx um the C9 supports every form of audio. Uh, it uh, has the full bandwidth for HDMI 2.1, whereas there's a, been a downgrade in the bandwidth on the C10, and it doesn't support DTS audio of any kind anymore on the C10, and picture quality-wise, they're the same. So I'd go grab a C9 right now. So a speaker setup is 5.2.2 using all DevTech uh, Mythos speakers plus a pair of in-ceiling top middles and a dual and dual uh, Velodyne 10-inch DD Plus subwoofers. Those are very mm-hmm. nice subwoofers. He completely loves it and he really enjoys Atmos. His couch is quite close to the back wall, so he doesn't have any physical space for surround backs or, and top rears or, in, or rear heights when it makes sense. He could add top fronts exactly where Dolby says they should go. He has no issues with adding another pair of in-ceiling speakers, but... We don't ever seem to talk about the combo of top fronts and top middles. Would it be worth it to have four overhead speakers? I want to say yes, but I really <laughs> can't. I mean, as somebody who ha- I... as somebody who has top fronts and top uh, middles, you have you no, have, I have front heights, front heights. And, and top middles. Yeah, front heights and top middles. I will tell you <laughs> that I don't see the value of having <laughs> top fronts or front heights or whatever they are. <laughs> the, they are, I have never in all of my experiences with <laughs> these speakers pointed at them and said they did a thing. Mm. They could be not playing at all. Uh, <laughs> and I would not know. I would, I assume they are not because <laughs> I mean, I know they make sound uh-huh. because whenever Atmo, whenever Odyssey does its test, they go. It makes a little ping mm-hmm. sound, but I have never heard them play a thing. So I still like to have four overheads if we're going to have overheads. Uh, now the reason we don't talk about top fronts and top middles as a combo is because that is not an available option in AV receivers. Right. Uh, in AV receivers, for whatever reason, they've set up the scheme where the names have to be like a gap in between. So you can have front heights plus top middles, or top front fronts plus top rears, or top middles plus rear heights, but you can't do the two positions that are right next to each other and label them as top middles and top fronts. However, if you have them, he says he can put them ideally where Dolby says to put them, which is a 45 degree elevation angle. Well, you'll notice that you are allowed to have front heights or top fronts at a 45 degree elevation angle. They overlap at that particular elevation angle of 45 degrees. So you can label them as front heights. They will still act just like top fronts. And I would say go for it because I always like to have four. And when 
you experience them, I would like to hear your experience and see if it differs from mine because maybe I'm doing it wrong. I am considering trying to, I just getting rid of my surround back speakers and eventually going with front heights, rear heights, and top middles once I get a receiver that can do all Ooh. that because I can just take those speakers and move them up. I was just looking at it and going, I bet I could do that. I bet I could do that. Anyways, just some comments from him, I guess. We're now along to the comment section of his <laughs> question. Even though his DevTech Mythos towers can play lower, he settled on using them. Uh, set, he settled on setting them to small with an eight hertz crossover because we cannot say anything different. That's all we say. And his Sony uh, 5000 ES receiver doesn't provide any option for LPF over LFE, so it's always set to 120 hertz. And even though it, it has two subware out outputs, they're just an internal Y splitter, so he has been sending out mono signal all along. He measured and measured, and th through th sheer trial and error, created his own dual subwoofer calibration so they were as uniform as possible prior to running uh, auto setup. The surprise, all of that was before listening to our advice. Wow, that is a surprise. <laughs> but now that he's read Rob's 12-step guide to setting up dual subwoofers, great minds think alike, I guess. What... Uh, what we recommend seems to be in perfect alignment with what he discovered on his own. That's and right. that is as it Stop should copy. be. Stop copying us. <laughs> that that is that is how we arrived at these uh, descriptions as well. It's it should work. That's why we recommend doing it. And if you found it through trial and error, uh, so much the better. It should stand yeah. up to trial. That's the whole point. You should be able to experiment with this and that's go, how science and works. Go, this <laughs> this is repeatable and uh, demonstrable, and that's why we say to do it. So, yay. <laughs> All right. Good job. Mm -hmm. uh, JR, as a reminder, JR uh, purchased a used setup that includes 6.1 Rotel Pre-Pro, a 5-channel Rotel Amp, and a 5.1 set of B&W CDM series speakers and sub. I don't remember what we said. I do remember keeping the amp was part of it and maybe not anything else. <laughs> As we suggested, he ditched the Rotel Pre-Pro and used his Denon 3310CI instead. While the Rotel did sound nice for two-channel li listening, it had too many shortcomings with no HDMI, no remote. Uh, the seller had lost it and no lossless audio support. He got everything connected and ran Odyssey Multi QXT. Unsurprisingly, it said his BMW uh, front tower speakers to large. So we followed our advice and manually set them to small with an 8 hertz crossover. The result was muddy mid bass performance and making some slight adjustments to the subwoofer didn't help. So we started playing with the crossover setting and through trial and error, setting the front speakers to 60 hertz sounded best, 40 hertz didn't sound as good, and the higher crossover frequencies didn't sound as good. So is there some magical formula for choosing the crossover frequency? Is he correct in his assumption that the reason 60 hertz sounded best was because the BMW towers are better at reproducing 80 hertz than the subwoofer is no the last part no. uh, the the towers the are last not part, no. just better at reproducing 80 hertz than your sub yeah. that's not the reason what's almost certainly the case is whatever is happening at that 80 hertz crossover area uh something funky I mean, he has a single subwoofer. It's not dual subwoofers. Yeah. So having yeah. some sort of resonant frequency or just a hump at your particular seat for where the sub is placed, uh, that right. the relationship there has resulted. I mean, he described it as a bit muddy sounding, so I would assume it's probably a hump as opposed to a yeah. dip. Um, but yeah, it, that that is almost... In, entirely the reason why it would sound that way now doing in your case for a single listening position a subwoofer crawl uh might be very helpful now as i recall he had done one before and wound up with his uh, i'm pretty sure he had the mirage speakers and mirage sub where he ended up moving his mm -hmm. mirage subwoofer to the side of his room instead of the front because via a subwoofer crawl he found that to be the best location but this bnw subwoofer that he just got uh is more capable than his old mirage sub now should that change 80 hertz a whole bunch? Probably not, because it's not as though the Mirage couldn't play 80 hertz. Um, but right. try another subwoofer crawl. This is by no means right. out of the realm of possibility. Um, that that could be part of it. But yeah. Um, so yeah, so what Rob's saying is basically the subwoofer itself, where it's located mm -hmm. in your room, is interacting with your room in such a way so that 80, the 80 hertz area is uh, boomy. Yeah. And that's giving you your, your muddiness. Uh, so by changing your crossover you're able to take that bass out of the sub put it back into the speakers and it's not quite as bad is that wrong i i, I mean if it sounds good to you now fine. i mean i am but rob's right always a fan mm -hmm. uh if you're willing to take the time to do so of playing individual sweeps through one speaker at a time 
I'm a fan of doing that so that you can see how linearly uh, the speaker plays by itself, first of all. And sometimes you'll discover you lucked out and where your front left speaker is in your particular seat, it can play down to like 30 hertz and sound linear. I mean, it happens. It's completely yeah. possible. Um, yeah. And then seeing how the integration of the that uh, one speaker with your subwoofer, how that sounds and trying to get that to sound later. And absolutely it can be the case where sometimes uh, it, a higher or lower crossover frequency gives you the result that you're after, which is the, the most linear response you can get from top to bottom. Uh, you know, 80 hertz is a very good starting point. It's, it's usually right. what works. It is not always the very best choice if you're willing Especially to Especially when you're only using speaker. one sub too. Exactly. If you're only using one sub that, that you, you're you're introducing a whole bunch of stuff. If you put a second sub in this room and place them correctly, I guess the 80 hertz would have sounded just sure. fine. So since he will be upgrading to a 4K HDR <laughs> display at some point in the not too distant future, an AV receiver or processor upgrade will go along with that. Would Odyssey Multi QXC32 do a better job than the version he has in his 3310? Or would he get better performance with better internals and more pure sound by getting a Rotel or Parasound processor? <laughs> I don't think Rotel has any... any room correction do they i'm not sure about room correction they do have processors now that have you know full 4k hdr hdmi right, inputs right. uh and that right. um but yes parasound i think does have some sort of their own pretty room sure correction yeah. thing, if i yeah. remember correctly yeah. uh but no the better internals and more pure sound <laughs> i don't that's just I mean, that's just marketing yeah that's just he's, marketing. he's and i mean very understandably you are far from yeah. being alone in having been convinced of this the higher price and the smaller crowd that is marketed to that there it must be superior right. that's the only way it could exist how could they charge this much if it weren't better well uh <laughs> it's actually kind of easy through marketing to do that sort of thing no uh, i would <laughs> completely I, I don't think you're gonna hear a world difference between multi q xt and XT32 just inherently um, they're not no. aiming for wildly different targets or anything like that so that's right. not going to be the reason um, but yeah right. there are certainly advances that have been made since your 3310 CI uh, I mean the the newest Denons that just got announced you might be a great candidate for their pre-amplifier mode where they're just like, yeah, we just turn off the internal amplifiers completely, give you the full four volt headroom on the pre outs, and you can drive that Rotel amp that you have all day long with exceedingly low noise. If you really don't want any room correction, you turn the thing to direct mode and room correction goes away. Simple as that with a button press. So, uh, plus, you'd have the option yeah. with the newest ones of having two completely separate uh, Odyssey configurations that you can switch between with the push of a button. So, I would go with a new Denon all day long. Right. There's very little, I mean, if you're not going to, if you, if you really want to go, you're like, oh, I want the best possible, you know, internals or purest sound or whatever. I mean, you're really not going from uh, a Denon or a Marantz or a Yamaha to a, you know, boutique processor you're really going from that to like a trin off <laughs> you know what i mean you go into you're going to a processor that can do 32 speakers right. all at the or same time you could uh, that you could go to, to the uh, the mono price the, uh, the mono price the yeah, htp one a mere four thousand yeah. dollars <laughs> so i mean if you really want to spend money we can help you spend money sure. that's not the problem but uh the room correction i think makes a pretty significant difference for most people not everybody i mean if you have a professionally designed room and blah 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 maybe you don't need as much room connection as everybody else but you still need some and uh you know going to a processor that doesn't have any or has you know uh an inferior version than the others there are other capable ones out there i mean it's not only odyssey you know the the uh Dirac definitely when it, yeah. when you can find that and the wipeout with the Yamaha yeah. are both perfectly fine it's just that Odyssey and Marantz and Denon are both effective and cheap <laughs> so you know I mean it's hard for us to recommend much else if you really want something that's you know got more power and more options well then you go to the monolith and then past mm -hmm. that you go to the turn off uh, but you don't go to Rotel I'm sorry <laughs> you don't it, it's it, it you're you're just buying you know a faceplate just go to a you know thrift store and scrape the rotel thing off of something and <laughs> put it on there aaron aaron is turning a room in his basement into a dedicated home theater the only opening is into the hallway and he will be adding a door hey. so this will be enclosed 
14 foot long by 15 foot wide by 9 foot tall room. It's not quite a perfect rectangle inside, and there are some soffits, uh, soffit on the back wall, but it's pretty close, a little, a little under 1,900 cubic feet in total. How tight does the seal need to be around the door to allow the room to be pressurized with base? The normal gap on our door would act as the air return for this room, so completely sealing up would mean a much bigger reno uh, to address HVAC. No, 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 no. The door is fine yeah you know, there's gonna be some leak you have to have a return there <laughs> do not do not make a you know you, you can only last in here for like an hour before you pass out from last of <laughs> lack of oxygen you don't need that the, the door is fine there will be some leakage it's fine but you need to have an air return down there yes. so you know the death doesn't imagine happen. imagine we're talking about water leaking out of the room right yeah. so if you have a little gap yeah. under the door it's not like a perfect seal some water is going to get out but that versus the door wide open or no door no door at all it's not like there's no difference there is a big difference between door closed and a little gap at the bottom and how much water leaks out of that versus no door at all right so that is exactly the type of difference that we're talking about uh you can definitely keep the little gap under the door so you aren't doing a huge hvac reno in addition to all of this Right. So we picked up six Klipsch reference series speakers at a crazy 80% off sale, $266 total. So he can't beat the price. He got a pair of R28F towers, two pair of R15 and bookshelf speakers. Upstairs in his wide open living room, he already had a pair of Klipsch Palladium bookshelf speakers. He wants to pick up a center speaker, but should he keep all of the reference series speakers in the theater and get a matching reference series center? Or should he move the mo much more expensive Klipsch Palladium speakers into the theater as his front left and right and then try to find a matching center for those? The Palladium series is discontinued, so whatever, whenever he sees any for sale, they're, they're still very expensive. So what do we think? And if he sticks with reference series in this theater, should he consider the higher price reference Premier series center? Uh, what does he have currently? So reference series, he's got six what of them, say? but he didn't get a center okay. at the time. And then he's got some... Uh, Klipsch Palladium, which was their flagship at one point, uh, upstairs. But he's like, well, I could move that pair of Palladiums into the theater and then try to find a Palladium or I guess it'd be like the Reference 3 series center, which is enormous. That center is yeah. so big, it's absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense and for this size of room. 14 by 15 by 9 foot room. It makes I mean, it's zero just... sense for this size of room. I mean, I just, it's just I would so I would keep speakers. his reference series together. That's what I because you can easily yeah. get yourself a reference series center. That's what I would do. I wouldn't go get a different series. Uh, just stick with the timbre match. Keep it all in the same series. That that would be my recommendation. Yeah, you don't need massive clip <laughs> speakers for your fourteen by fifteen by nine foot room. They'll you'll you'll be putting I mean less than half a watt in them. <laughs> at reference volume mm -hmm. practically i mean it's just it's just ridiculously large so uh yeah I, I like this i mean i don't see why we need to spend a whole bunch of money to try to no. match this th these reference speakers keep them upstairs in your or whatever you have them you know put them in the biggest room you got in your house <laughs> you know, the palladiums you mean they could yeah, yeah you could definitely fill that space oh i would, I would keep so the play much less expensive so i mean reference series is like Klipsch's entry level because the naming is weird uh but yeah, yeah. I, I would keep those all together in your theater get a get a nice inexpensive easily affordable easy to find reference series center okay he plans to sit eight feet away from the front wall of his room leaving six feet behind him and again the room is 15 feet wide does it make sense to go for a full 7.2.4 configuration <laughs> no uh, the room's bigger than mine it. Sure. You can, oh, you're a, you're a psycho. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I, look, so he's going to have six feet behind him. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. There is no reason why you couldn't do seven point two point four. Agreed. You can do that. You can do it. Uh, I I don't <laughs> think you should. <laughs> <laughs> but you could. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where I'm going to leave that. I mean, I, there's nothing that says that you can't do it. Right. Uh, there's uh there's enough space behind you to put surround backs yeah. there's enough space above you because it's nine feet but then at nine feet the you know the top rears are going to be awfully close to the surround backs that's going to be the mm. case but you can cheat them forward a little bit sure you know based on the angles and stuff like that and there's a definite but, difference in height for sure yes for sure yeah um so yes you can do yep. it i would start with 5.2.4 <laughs> and then i would you know 
just stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Try some <laughs> surround backs and see if you like them. Or just stop there. You can do that too. <laughs> uh, he would like to have a four seat setup, which would mean the two outside seats are at a fairly wide angle and. Uh, with the front wall only eight feet away. Does it make sense to go with a projection setup or should you just get a 75 or 85 inch flat panel? He's only eight feet away. From the front wall, you, no less. So a front, a front wall, panel right. would, a flat panel would be at least six inches closer right. than the wall itself. And if you put it on like one of those three in one stands, you could have it a foot or a foot and a half closer to you if you wanted to. And it wouldn't, it would yeah. still look really slick. It would still look like it's mounted. Yeah, I I like going with the flat panel here. For this uh, if distance, you can. yeah. For this distance, I mean, basically, if I had a flat panel and it was sitting a foot or so, a 75 inch, 85 inch flat panel, and it was sitting a foot, foot or foot and a half, maybe in front of where my current, you know, front wall is, I don't think the viewing angles would be significantly different than my 90 mm. whatever. It I is, mean, 22 inch. A screen. 77 inch OLED from seven feet away. Ah, uh, that's that's real nice. <laughs> yeah, and wide viewing angles. He really likes the TCL six series TVs that he has upstairs. He would strongly consider a seventy five inch six series or eight series or the brand new eighty five inch Vizio P Quantum X. What do we think we should get for his display? I think all of those are good ideas. <laughs> those, <laughs> think... those are all very nice displays. Yeah. I think you should get a 77-inch OLED, though. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah. That's how I really think. You... I mean, he's building a whole dedicated theater. He can black this thing out. He's going whole hog on the audio 7.2.4. I'm like, why not go whole hog on the display? Nothing's going to look better than an OLED in here. And if you're worried about the wide viewing angles, nothing's going to look better than an OLED for that. So, yeah, 77-inch yeah. OLED on a three-in-one stand so that it is one foot in front of your eight-foot-away front wall. So he's heard us recommend the Boston Acoustic Soundware 4.5 from Accessories for Less for Atmos speakers. Those could actually uh, mount easily on the soffit at the back of this room. He's already owns uh, some Boston Acoustic bookshelf speakers. Could he mount those as front heights? Uh he always, I'll just continue reading because this question goes on. He always, he also already owns a pair of Polk in wall speakers. They are rectangles, not circles. He isn't sure if he wants to put any large holes in the ceiling. So, what do we think is the best approach for Atmos speakers in the setup? And does it matter if there are slightly different distances? We'll obviously correct for that. Um, th are we still at the guy with the Klipsch? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, the problem with Klipsch is how efficient <laughs> they are. They're just like stupid efficient, which is great in that you can play them very loud with very little power. But what ends up happening is level matching between them and other speakers tends to be problematic because uh, you have to put so little power into them and so much more power into something else that getting the level match mm. can be can be problematic. But with now, all distances as short as they are in this setup, it should be fine. Should be now fine. timbre matching is also. Mm probably not going to be an issue here as well but again these are Atmos these are speakers Atmos so <laughs> i'm telling you things that you make you may want to consider mm. for why you might want to just stick with clips all the way around mm. now if it's too expensive or it's not what you want that's fine but be warned that you know if you you know try if you put your speaker you know you put your uh, room correction on and the, the auto setup and it sets all the all the clip speakers to minus 12 and all the <laughs> overhead speakers to plus 12 it could not level match it could not get them close enough to each other i don't other. actually think I that'll don't, happen in this in this I don't setup either. though with these short distances i don't think that'll be the case as long as you're you're using your the whatever you're going to put overhead as just overheads and there are physically close you know fairly close to you that I think it should be fine. Uh, level matching again, not level matching, uh, timbre matching mm. would be problematic. But we're talking about Atmos speakers and no one really cares. Yeah, so I'm in favor uh, more, of doing yeah. this as in the room as opposed to making any big holes. I'm definitely in favor of yeah. that. Uh, so yeah, I, I I mean, yeah, a pair of Boston Acoustics bookshelf speakers mounted high up on your front wall in the in the front wall to ceiling corner there acting as your front heights and some Soundware 4.5s mounted to the soffit behind you. I have very little problem with that. If you do decide that you want to keep it all Klipsch, Klipsch has in the reference series some of those wedge shaped speakers which they call atmos modules right they can be they can be the up firing ones sitting on top of your speakers but you'll notice in their own description of them they're like you can also just mount these on the wall and use them as angled height speakers um that right. is totally doable so that that is the other option to go yeah 
So he asks which subwoofers. He can put them at the midpoints of the front and back wall. Any reason to go bigger than the PB1000? Uh, it's 1,900 square feet, right? Cubic feet. feet, right? Yeah, I mean, PB1000s would be fine in this one, oh, I yeah. think. I mean, you could, you could go... I would still build the box. I mean, it sounds like you're going to have plenty of space in yeah. here, but I would still build the box. Uh, and, and when we say that, remember, we're talking about getting some cardboard, physically creating a taped together structure that is the size of what the PB-1000 mm -hmm. is. PB-1000 is big. It's not yeah. the biggest. It's not the most massive, but it is quite large. And you may just want to spend a little bit extra money and go to SB-2000. Right. I guess, yeah. yeah. That's pro pro now, right? It's yeah, SB it would be SB-2000 pro. pro now, yeah, for the, the sealed Which box would give version. You, yeah, it would just give you a, a much smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. um, much. <laughs> but uh, it would cost more. But yeah, I th I think uh, I think the PB one thousand as far as filling the room with bass. Would oh, be fine. in terms of output and extension, there's no reason to go beyond that. The only reason would be if they are physically too large and you need a more capable but sealed and physically smaller sub. Then you'd have to pay a bit more to get that. Hmm. All right, uh, he was considering the X the Denon X sixty five hundred H for the receiver, but he already has a Lexicon. RV8 receiver that isn't being used at the moment. You should sell that. <laughs> Can pay for all this other stuff. Uh, he could. It could serve as an external amp, so he could save a bit and get the X4500H instead. Then which speaker should he uh, power with his Lexicon? You should... Dude, you have Klipsch speakers. <laughs> yeah, you're, and a very short distances between all of your and, speakers. Uh, in, in the history, like if you added all the power <laughs> that you ever put into them over the course of a year and had asked for it all at once, you would still not need an external amplifier, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. The only reason is he's saying, like, the X4500H has nine amplifiers built in. If he wants 11 speakers, then he needs some kind of external amp. You absolutely I would there's... sell that lexicon so fast, dude. <laughs> I, it, it would be on audio gone, right? Mm. It would be gone on audio gone already. I would have gotten rid of it. I'd buy a Dayton audio two channel, the just the smallest possible 10 <laughs> watt amp like they and sell power your rear heights with power those your because rear heights with that won't and you're matter good to go um yeah. yeah i mean if you do keep the lexicon and use it as an external amp yes you absolutely can there's there's no technical reason why you can't uh use it as a two channel or more there's um, no objective reason why you need to but <laughs> there's right. no technical reason why you can't but yes given your tiny distances and the efficiency of all your main speakers it really doesn't matter which ones you choose in this setup it doesn't matter which ones you choose because any amplifier connected to any of the speakers in your setup will be perfectly fine. And if you don't believe us, feel free to buy the receiver first, connect everything to it, and then, uh, except for the two channels that you can't do, and then unconnect everything and put it all <laughs> in the lexicon and tell us that you can hear a difference and we'll tell you that you're just but I, I do up. agree with getting the X4500 instead of the X6500 yeah. because it's like, yeah. even at Accessories for Less, it's like a six or $700 difference. So by yeah. all means, save that money. And even if it means buying a $100 two-channel amp to add to the 4500, you're still way ahead in total price. Lastly, he asks, uh, how does he determine what room treatments he will need? He will have a thick rug over vinyl tile flooring. The back wall... Uh, I'm sorry, the, and part of the back wall has bookshelves along it, but he isn't exactly sure what else he needs. So, generally speaking, first reflection points, sure. which is if you run a mirror, if you sit in the main seat and you run a mirror along the wall where you see your, the your side walls. front left, the side walls, the front left, if it's a left wall, when you see your left speaker, that's the first reflection point. Same thing on the right wall. When you see your right speaker in the mirror, that's where your first reflection point is. You put an absorption panel there. You put absorption panels on the back wall where there's not a bookshelf. You put absorption <laughs> panel on the front wall behind the speakers mm -hmm. and then everywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's where you start. I, I mean, is it as much as possible? I think he can benefit from corner base trapping that that's sure. uh, a largely about that crossover region between your speakers and dual subwoofers. Uh, you're going to have a very nice uniform, even linear uh, base response. Once you've uh, positioned the subs, the way you say middle of the front wall, middle of the back wall, and then run your room correction. But in that crossover region is where small rooms like this can have some base build up so corner base traps it seems like this is a dedicated room to it uh, i'm all in yeah. favor of that um the general rule of thumb is that you're going for about 30 percent of the total surface area 
Uh, so all six surfaces in your room, about 30% of that covered in absorption of some kind. But once you have, if you do all four corners and then a couple of panels on each side wall, a couple of panels on the back wall and uh, panels behind each of your speakers, that gets you pretty close to that uh, with the full rug over your, uh, over your floor. It gets you kind of close to there. The last bit is you might want to do some measurements after that to see if decay times in your upper mid range and treble actually Actually get longer than the rest of the mid-range. If they do, that's an indication you could benefit from having some diffusion. And a great place to put diffusion is on the rear sections of your side walls, because the front sections of your side walls will be your first reflection points where absorption goes. So the rear sections of your side walls and the ceiling is where diffusion can be very, very effective. Um, and that, like, Going beyond 50% of the surfaces covered, 30% in absorption, 20% in diffusion. If you have to do more than that, you've got serious problems that I wouldn't expect in a rectangular room. Hmm. All right, that's going to be it for this week. Who do we have left? We have one question from Infinite Gary. We have a question from Tate L. And one from RD. That's it. All right. I want to thank our listeners of the week. I want to thank our 121 patrons over at patreon.com, as well as their... Notes of gratitude from John, Luke, Dan, and Tate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So patreon.com slash podcast. if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, a voluntary subscription, if you please. 121 patrons over there, so thank you very much for that. Anyone who'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal. Come to our website, avrant.com, and on the right-hand side, it says support AV Rant. That'll take you to PayPal. And then thank you to John, Luke, Dan, and Tate for your notes of gratitude. Thank you to everybody listening and uh thanks so much for continuing to send in questions to this podcast for av rant i'm tom mantry and i'm rob h now stay in and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.